Great. All right, we are live. So joining me today, an extra, extra special guest, uh, Chris Letheby. So Chris, uh, for those who don't know you, I wonder if you could say a little bit about who you are and what you do. Sure, thanks Richard, and um, thanks very much for the invitation to come on. So um, I'm a lecturer in philosophy at the University of Western Australia, it's in um, Perth, and I'm half-time there. I'm also half-time as a postdoc at the University of Adelaide, and um, by training I'm a philosopher of mind and cognitive science, so I did my studies at the University of Adelaide, um, did a P master's and a PhD there in philosophy of cognitive science, and my main area of interest, the topic of my PhD thesis and most of my subsequent work is the use of classic or serotonergic psychedelic drugs like LSD and psilocybin in neuroscience and psychiatry. So that's looking at recent trials that use psychedelics as therapeutic um, interventions for treatments like anxiety, depression and addiction, and also sort of basic research that's highly philosophically relevant that aims to use psychedelics as research tools to understand the neural bases and mechanisms of consciousness and self-awareness and this kind of thing. So that's me. That's what I do. That's awesome. Yeah, it's, it's really cool because one thinks that this is like something that should have been looked at previously, given the the uh, the relevance to a lots of claims of philosophy of mind and cognitive science, and yet it's only relatively recently that this has kind of gained um, respectability and that people are looking into this. Um, and I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about wh what your impressions are, why why that may might be the case. Sure, yeah. So, I mean, psychedelics, like a lot of psychedelics occur naturally. Um, DMT, mescaline and psilocybin occur in various plants and animals and have histories of medicinal and religious use going back at least centuries, quite probably millennia in various cultures. But they really only came to the attention of the Western world and also of modern science in sort of well, to an extent in the late 19th, early 20th centuries, there was some interest in mescaline, um, but really it was after Albert Hoffman discovered LSD in the 1940s that scientists became seriously interested in these drugs. And so there was a, a wave of research for about 15 or 20 years, I guess, from the, um, well, yeah, from around 1950 to around 1970 when psychedelics were a hot topic and an extremely respectable topic of research in neuroscience, psychiatry and various other disciplines. Um, philosophers never really caught on to a great extent, which is interesting. There were a few people. There was um, J.R. Smithies, the philosopher and neuroscientist back then who was involved in some of the studies with mescaline and published a paper in um, BJPS, the British Journal for the Philosophy of Science. But for, And there were a couple of others. I mean, Merleau-Ponty um, took mescaline and wrote about it, but yeah. yeah, for some reason, not many philosophers um, caught on. And then, of course, for various reasons, psychedelics ended up becoming sociopolitically highly controversial for a combination of, you know, somewhat good and, and also overwhelmingly bad reasons um, ended up being prohibited. And then the research basically was was more or less shut down, at least in humans, for a couple of decades. And because they became so sociopolitically controversial and because their reputation was so or the new wave of research that's been starting up again since the early 90s has had to proceed very slowly and very carefully and in the face of a lot of obstacles. And so it's really only been in the last 10 years or so that that's been kind of coming to fruition in a major way and the sort of results of that research have been reaching a wider public. So, so when they, I mean, maybe this is something that's outside your area of expertise, but I'm just a little bit curious about the early history of this. Uh, so when LSD was first discovered, I mean, I, I had heard that it had been um, sort of pioneered as a um, truth drug or something like that and for interrogation purposes. Uh, but and it doesn't seem like it was really being looked at as a way for for therapeutic. Uh, oh, it was. Is that it was, correct? It was oh, it was. OK. Yeah, yeah, it was studied for just about anything you can imagine back in the 50s and 60s. Okay. So yeah, the CIA infamously had the MK Ultra program in which they wanted to see if it could be used as a, a truth serum or a brainwashing agent. But there were all sorts of other research programs. So, you know, the main one was the sort of psychotomimetic paradigm, the idea that these drugs induce experiences that are similar to naturally occurring psychoses, if not identical. And so by studying their mechanisms of action, we can learn something about the biochemical bases of mental illness. And the very very fact that a drug like LSD could have such dramatic effects on consciousness in such minute doses was really crucial in confirming that there is such a thing as the biochemical basis of mental illness. You know, it played a role in kind of confirming that serotonin is involved in regulating mood and cognition and so on. Um, but so that was sort of the initial thought is that these drugs are psychotomimetics. But then um, 
as they continue to conduct the research and administer them to people into various um, conditions under various circumstances, they noticed that you didn't always get these stereotypically psychotic reactions, right? Sometimes you would get people having transcendent mystical or religious experiences. So that led to the sort of mystico mimetic paradigm, the thought that, well, studying these drugs can teach us something about the nature of mystical or religious experience, even about yeah. the historical genesis of religion. But then they also noticed that some people kind of who had these mystical experiences reported really transformative effects, right? They reported kind of changes, lasting positive changes in personality and behavior and well-being. And so, yeah, so there was a really robust program of research using them as psychotherapeutic aids. Um, and uh, a lot of that early research was methodologically a bit substandard, but there are some really good trials for alcoholism. So there was a recent meta-analysis of studies from the 1950s and 60s that found solid evidence for the efficacy of high-dose LSD in the treatment of alcoholism. And um, it was also used, I don't know that there were many, if any, rigorous trials, but um, it was certainly used for the treatment of anxiety, depression, and existential distress in terminally ill patients. That was one, and that's now become the sort of best studied indicator in the recent wave of research as well. And, and that actually continued all the way into the 70s, into the late 70s. They were still, despite the fact that no new projects were being funded or approved, um, psychedelics like DPT, dipropyl tryptamine, were still being given to um, dying patients well into the yeah, mid to late 70s. Interesting. Yeah. So I wonder what, what so I know it was classified, like a lot of these drugs were classified as um, having no therapeutic use, uh, sometimes, I guess, in the late 70s, or I'm not sure exactly when this happened. But uh, so what's been the recent change? Why are people rediscovering this? Yeah, well, I think some people who were involved in that early research never sort of let go, never, never kind of let the, the flame go out. So one guy in particular is um, Bill Richards, who's at Johns Hopkins, who was involved in, in fact, he was um, at, with on the team that I was just talking about, I think at Spring Grove Hospital, who were still administering psychedelics to dying patients into the 70s. And so people like that have sort of maintained their belief that there's um, a lot of value in these substances if they're used carefully. And then there have been people like Rick Doblin and MAPS, the Multidisciplinary Association for Psychedelic Studies, and they have been sort of campaigning for the therapeutic potential and the safety and so on of psychedelics to be revisited since the mid 80s. So, mm -hmm. you know, even though in the, these drugs kind of went off the radar in the mainstream, there have always been people and obviously, in some cases, these are people who have had their own experiences in various, um, you know, illegal contexts and have become yeah. convinced personally that there's something really valuable here. But yeah, basically, it's, it's been a lot of really hard work from um, a lot of people who were convinced that there was something valuable here that needed to be revisited. And then, the circumstances needed to be right, the stars needed to align in terms of, you know, the culture changing a bit and people, you know, the authorities being ready to give this another go. Right. And it seems like that's happening because, I mean, I was just talking with someone uh, on Thursday, Heather Berlin, who was telling me that they're opening up a, a, a psychedelic therapy center at Mount Sinai in New York. Um, so this is sort of entering the mainstream at this point, I guess. I mean, or it's, vert, it's poised to be entering the mainstream. And I guess that's really because we have some good evidence that this actually works um, in, yeah. in many contexts. And so I know you in your book, which is really excellent, by the way, uh, but before we get too involved, is this book coming out? Um, is it out already or is it uh, going to be out soon? It's not out yet. It's going to be out probably in March at the moment. They're okay. saying March. Yeah. Okay. So, it, and it's called the philosophy of psychedelics. Yeah. Yeah. It's an excellent book. It's really well written and it's very thorough. And I really hope that people read it that are interested in Thank these uh, uh, therapists, psychiatrists, psychologists, but also philosophers. There's a, I mean, it's a tremendously rich source for philosophy as well. Anyway, so we'll get back to that, but I know you have a whole chapter in the book where you kind of go through all the evidence detailing the safety and efficacy of these sorts of things. And, and of course we should mention, you said it at the beginning, but we should mention that you restrict your attention to a certain class. Um, so psychedelics is a broad term, but you, yeah. you want to narrowly focus on the ones you mentioned at the beginning. Uh, but anyway, yeah, so I wonder if you could say a little bit about your, your focused and uh, some of the evidence that this is successfully administered. Yeah, sure. So yeah, as you say, I'm looking specifically at um, 
serotonin 2A receptor agonists. So yeah, the most famous examples are LSD, mescaline, psilocybin, and DMT. And there are some, probably some like relatively minor, some people would say slightly larger pharmacological and phenomenological differences, but these drugs all form a unified class and the evidence is pretty strong that their psychoactive effects are mediated primarily by this serotonin 2A receptor agonist action, even if there are other receptors playing a role. And so, yeah, that, that's the class for which the term psychedelic is in increasingly being reserved. That's kind of becoming the standard nomenclature. Um, they're also known as um, classic psychedelics, serotonergic psychedelics, serotonergic hallucinogens. But yeah, as you say, there are other drugs that have been called psychedelic on phenomenological grounds, because even though they have quite different pharmacological mechanisms, the effects on experience overlap to a significant degree. And these are things like salvia divinorum, um, dissociative right. anesthetics like ketamine, things like cannabis, um, MDMA. And so, yeah, I'm not talking about any of them. I'm just restricting my attention to the classic psychedelics for no other reason than that early in my PhD, I realized I needed to narrow my focus. Um, I mean, I also, like a lot of people, I am especially interested in the classic psychedelics. I do think there's something about them. Um, but yeah, it was also just a very pragmatic decision. So yeah, when we restrict ourselves to those, um, the evidence base is mounting. I mean, it's certainly not sufficient yet, I don't think, to warrant to kind of justify clinical use. I mean, it's not really my area anyway, but basically there's a bunch of studies, um, I think, yeah, I guess they've all really taken place over the last 20 years. So there were some studies in the 1990s um, with DMT. So Rick Strassman at um, New Mexico was doing studies with DMT and healthy volunteers, and then Franz Vollenweider and his group in Zurich doing studies with psilocybin. But that was all um, basic science, neuroimaging, not therapeutic trials. So but that, of course, contributed to the evidence for safety, and that's the major hurdle that needs to be crossed after the right. reputation psychedelics have acquired over the years is safety. And so that's where the evidence now is really clear cut, right? So in this new wave of research over the last 30 years, um, I have trouble finding exact figures, but many, many hundreds of, of volunteers, some healthy without a psychiatric diagnosis, some have a diagnosis of anxiety, depression, addiction. Um, and I saw in one paper, the figure was that 2000 plus doses of psilocybin have been administered. So that doesn't mean 2000 plus volunteers, some received right. multiple doses, but 2000 plus doses of psilocybin in carefully controlled conditions without a single lasting adverse effect. So sometimes and during the experience, people have some kind of intense fear or anxiety, but that can be managed and it doesn't seem to leave any um, sort of trauma or mental scars or anything like that. Right. So that's the safety issue is that it's, uh, people sometimes thought that this would induce like a permanent psychotic break or something like that. Right. And there's no evidence that that's the case is, or uh, even if there are bad trips or whatever, this is something that can be recovered from. That's what the evidence. Suggests. Well, there's no evidence that that happens when and there's good evidence that that doesn't happen when strict safety guidelines are followed. And that includes, among other things, exclusion criteria. Right. So no one with a personal history or an immediate family history of any psychotic mental illness is admitted into these trials because the going theory is that that's when you have the risk of a lasting psychotic break is when there's some genetic predisposition and the, the drug experience can kind of trigger or catalyze it. And, um, you know, I mean, it's hard to draw firm conclusions, but what so far what this spate of studies has shown is that by following these strict guidelines, which don't just, you know, go, they go beyond those exclusion criteria. It's also about kind of making sure people are well prepared. They're well informed about the things they might experience. They've got people on hand to give them reassurance if need be. And especially in the therapeutic trials, there's a very specific protocol that tends to be followed with you know, a playlist, music in earphones, an eye mask, two therapists present. Um, but yeah, basically what's been shown is that under controlled conditions, when all these guidelines are followed, the safety profile is really, really good. And um, physiologically as well, and in terms of addiction liability, these drugs are definitely safer than a lot of other drugs that are used routinely for medicinal purposes. Yeah. yeah. I mean, it's important to emphasize that no one's saying, you know, <clears throat> go take some magic mushrooms out in the woods and you, it's going to be therapeutically beneficial. I mean, these are very controlled circumstances. In fact, in your book, you say they're actually, you know, coached beforehand a little bit, right? They, they have, uh, they work through like what the possible effects will be and what they experience and the, to adopt this kind of attitude of openness and kind of flowing right. with it. Yeah. Yeah. Trust, let go and be open is the mantra. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And the clinical wisdom from the 50s and 60s suggests that that's, that's what tends to promote a beneficial experience. Whereas when you resist what's happening, um, that's when you can end up in a freak out. Right.
Exactly. So it's like, you know, the, the hippies of the old would go, uh, some of them believed in dosing, you know, going around and dosing people who are not expecting it. That's extremely dangerous because that's when you're most liable to resist it, it seems. Um, Terrible, know, hugely, hugely unethical idea. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah, well, not only that, but I mean, it's all, I guess, because, you know, people who have had these really profound experiences think there's something beneficial, obviously, but also something essentially important that's revealed. And so there was an attitude, I guess, amongst certain persons, you know, Timothy Leary being kind of a leader in this area, that everyone should be required to have these experiences and the people who were square or resisted it should be sort of forced into doing it. And that's, that's, that's incredibly dangerous. Uh, if you're not yeah. prepared for it, then this is, that's not a good idea. That's not what right. anyone's recommended. Um, right. But there is a lot of evidence that you, that you talk about in your book that there's actually uh, for addiction, for depression, for anxiety, that this actually works. Um, and the question is, why does it work? I mean, I, is, that the, is that the right way of framing the debate? I mean, that is a huge question. Yeah, as yet not answered definitively. Yeah. But um, so you get some clues from what you see across these studies. And it's worth emphasizing that at the moment, a lot of these are kind of open label, uncontrolled trials. So I think when you think about um, addiction, I think all that's really been published so far is there's one study of psilocybin for alcoholism, one study of psilocybin for tobacco addiction. Um, then if you think about depression, there's Oh, there's also observational studies of people taking part in ayahuasca retreats for the, the treatment of addiction. Um, depression, there's one, again, open label study of psilocybin for treatment resistant depression. And I think there's one randomized controlled trial with ayahuasca. The biggest evidence base is for the treatment of existential distress, um, anxiety and depression in end of life in people with a terminal diagnosis. So there again, you've got a couple of small um, open label. I think one of them is controlled and one of them is with LSD as well, one of the very few kind of studies to be done with LSD. But then there's a couple of bigger um, double blind randomized controlled trials. And what is so interesting across all of these studies is with some variation, but generally you get a very consistent picture. And it's that after one to three sessions with the drug, you get um, reductions in the symptoms of whatever the pathology is for weeks, months, even sometimes years. Um, and a specific type of experience seems to predict um, these lasting changes in, in symptoms. And that's the so-called mystical type experience. And so that fact, the fact that you sort of get that kind of finding across all the studies is one of the things that gives me confidence that this is kind of not just a placebo effect. It's not just an artifact, even though you know, there are big phase three studies underway now in which it's really going to be put to the test rigorously. And this is, I think, mostly for depression, sort of testing psilocybin for depression across multiple different sites. But the fact that you have this kind of consistent finding, and that extends to studies with healthy volunteers as well. So you have mm. healthy volunteers who have some interest in spirituality or have a spiritual practice or whatever, and um, they get given the drug. And again, not everyone satisfies the psychometric criteria for the mystical type experience. And it's the people who do that tend to show lasting um, personality changes and increases in self-reported well-being and quality of life and that kind of thing. So it seems that, yeah, across different psychiatric conditions and even in people who don't have one, you get these lasting increases in well-being when a specific type of experience occurs on the drug. And so what, what's the, I mean, I know you go through it, but can you tell us what the definition of a, meta, uh, a mystical experience is? That seems sure. to be unifying. Yeah, yeah. So it comes, um, it's drawn from the work of uh, Walter Stace, the philosopher who in turn was drawing on Aldous Huxley's work on the perennial philosophy. And so the idea is, and I should mention that this is a contested idea, but the claim is that when you look at um, the mystical literature of the world's religions across times, places and cultures and so on, it's not to say this is the only type of experience you find, but the claim is that there is a distinctive type of experience that crops up again and again that is reported notably by religious practitioners, people who engage in some spiritual discipline but also sometimes by people who don't, who just have the experience spontaneously. Um, and the thought is that while these experiences are kind of um, interpreted and just, you know, discussed in the la language of whatever the culture and time and place is, that there is some common core, as it's called. There's a common phenomenological core that is culturally invariant. And so the exact list of criteria has varied a bit. Oh, of course, I should mention William James as well. So in the, the right. you know, Western <laughs> philosophy and psychology, he really blazed this trail. I think he had four criteria, but I think in the instruments that are most commonly used, there are seven, right? So to be a, um, 
they talk about mystical type experience um, as an experience that sort of um, ticks these psychometric boxes. And we can talk about the distinction between mystical and mystical type experience. But the criteria are supposed to be a, a sense of unity, oneness or interconnectedness, right? So this feeling that everything is one and the individual sense of self dissolves. Um, let me see if I can get them all. Like I always seem to miss one or two. <laughs> So there's the sense of unity or oneness, uh, the noetic quality, very important, the feeling that this is more real than real, that I'm gaining some kind of direct, unmediated knowledge or metaphysical insight into how things really are. Um, paradoxicality, so people tend to talk in language that sounds contradictory. They talk about um, an empty unity that was at the same time full and complete, things like that. Ineffability, they insist that the experience can't adequately be described in words before going on to, this is a cliche, this is not my point, but before going on to talk about it endlessly. Yeah, um, exactly. <laughs> uh, deeply felt positive mood. Um, oh, transcendence of time and space. Yeah, the feeling that the experience is one outside the confines of um, ordinary spatial awareness and it's an experience of eternity or atemporality. Um, missing one that one the ego dissolution no that's sort of subsumed under unity okay um, uh -huh. yeah yeah well, six is good unity. six is good yeah, it's, it's enough to be getting on with. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> yeah so and, and so the idea is that pete so you have a questionnaire afterwards and people who rate themselves as having these kinds of experiences that correlates with the people who have positive benefits yeah, um, that's right. And so you, you don't need all seven of them, or do you, uh, to count yeah. as having a mystical experience? So I should say the the one, the particular instrument that I'm thinking of that has these seven criteria is uh, the MEQ, the Mystical Experience Questionnaire. There are other instruments that get used. There's the 5D ASC, Five Dimensions of Altered States of Consciousness, and that has a one of the five dimensions is um, oceanic boundlessness, which is not described in precisely the same way, but is pretty clearly a proxy for something like a mystical type experience. But when um, this MEQ is being used, the definition of uh, uh, what they call a complete mystical type experience is 60% or more on each of those seven criteria, basically. So you're asked, you know, how true was this of your experience? And it's a scale of, you know, no more than everyday experience up to, you know, more than ever before in my life. And if you score 60% or more on all of the criteria, that's considered a complete mystical type experience. Yeah. Okay. And so this kind of gives rise to the, <clears throat> what you call the comforting delusion uh, objection, which is that, you know, there's kind of an ethical question here because a lot of a lot of people might think, well, um, the thing that's doing the beneficial, that's giving you the beneficial results are these kind of delusional beliefs about the nature of reality, which probably aren't true or something like that. And so maybe we should wonder if we should get people to have these delusional beliefs. Um, and you you want to address this head on, but can you say a little bit about what, um, you know, am I getting it right? And also what your strategy towards it is. Yeah, so that's right. And so it kind of becomes a problem if you're sympathetic to philosophical views like naturalism, physicalism, materialism, if you think that the natural world is all there is, that um, the mind is purely physical, it's in some sense the activity of the biological brain or body, and so you think there is in reality, no such thing as a cosmic consciousness or a divine transcendent le level of reality or, or, or something like that, because it looks on the face of it like, as you say, what is going on here, especially when you look at its use in end of life care, where people are anxious about their um, impending mortality. You give right. them the drugs and some of them have this transcendent mystical experience and their fear of death seems to decrease dramatically. It reconciles them to their impending death. And so if you're sympathetic to naturalism or materialism or whatever, the obvious uh, sort of thing you think is, well, it's a comforting delusion. These are experiences. They're having this intense hallucinatory experience. Owen Flanagan calls it a metaphysical hallucination, which I think is a great <laughs> phrase. Um, so it looks like, yeah, the drugs are inducing not just um, physical hallucinations that the wall is breathing and there's geometric patterns on everything but at high doses they induce metaphysical hallucinations that you know we are one with the divine ground of being with the cosmic consciousness which underlies the universe and then people come back and they have this belief that you know who I this body that I you know is going to die that's not who I really am who or what I really am is this eternal infinite kind of timeless divine reality and Obviously, in the face of death, that would be a very comforting belief, especially if it were backed by this noetic quality, if it was something that had the kind of overwhelming authority of kind of direct, immediate experience. It feels right. like 
waking up from the dream of everyday life into, you know, what has always been real and will always be real. And so, yeah, I mean, as a, as a naturalist, this looks worrying to me because I think the arguments are pretty good that consciousness is just created by the brain. There is no cosmic consciousness. And so, yeah, as you say, there's this worry um, that it looks like we're treating psychiatric disorder by um, inducing comforting but implausible metaphysical beliefs. Yeah, I mean, some people actually do endorse the, I guess, verticality of these beliefs. I mean, I know some people who are idealists. I mean, they're kind of vocal on Twitter, but one of the main reasons they're idealists is because of psychedelic experience. That's not the only reason to endorse idealism, I guess I'll say, having talked with some serious idealists. But at least there is a tradition of people saying, you know, that we should take these um, these things seriously. And you're suspicious of that move, right? Uh, I am, yeah. Although, you know, I, I, I come and go on this. I'm on the fence sometimes. I mean, I was an idealist in my misspent youth. Um, ah. And, um, <laughs> you know, I, I have a colleague here at UWA, Miri Al-Bahari, who's currently engaged in the project of trying to formulate and defend what she calls a perennial idealist metaphysic, which very much is the type of metaphysic that people come away from these experiences talking about. For Miri herself, it's got no psychedelic basis whatsoever. It's based in Aldous Huxley, the perennial philosophy and all this stuff. But yeah, mm -hmm. so there definitely are people and there's a lot of them in the psychedelic sphere who say, um, take it at face value. It's real. It's not a metaphysical hallucination. It's a metaphysical revelation. Um, yeah, absolutely. But yeah, I'm suspicious of that. I do think on balance, um, physicalism is, is probably... Um, a more plausible view. And I think that partly because I presume we'll get into this at some point, but partly because I think I've got a really good error theory for the consci cosmic consciousness experience. I think I've got a really good, and it's not really my original idea, but the more and more I think about it, the more and more it makes sense, a story about why and how these experiences might come about, even if the corresponding metaphysical view were not true, even if physicalism were true. But that's the worry. So the worry is that, um, you know, Naturalism is true and um, psychedelics work by, they bring about their therapeutic and transformative effects by inducing non-naturalistic metaphysical beliefs. And this is something we should care about. We should care about the epistemic status of um, therapies. So this looks like a problem for psychedelic therapy. And so there are these different ways you can respond. You can either say, well, naturalism is false. You can go the cosmic consciousness idealist route, or you can say, well, who really cares? It's not, you know, the epistemic status is not that important as long as it kind of really benefits people. And that's, you know, that's a crude kind of rendition, but that's sort of the Owen Flanagan, George Graham view. They talk about these experiences and say, look, you know, the benefits are so great that really, um, you know, the kind of epistemic qualms pale in comparison. Um, so you can go one of those two ways or you can accept the conclusion. And what I'm trying to do is, yes, yeah, uh, offer an alternative, a different way of responding that sort of hangs on to the idea that naturalism is true and hangs on to the idea that we should care about the epistemic status of therapies, but still ends up giving basically a, an okay verdict for psychedelic therapy. Right. And the general part of the general strategy is to argue for what Lisa Bordololi calls the epistemic innocence of these kinds of things. And I think that's a really cool strategy. Um, so uh, first of all, can you tell us what that what sh she means by that and how um, how it's going to play into your defense? Sure. Yeah. So it was really serendipitous that Lisa started doing this work on epistemic innocence right when I was starting my PhD on psychedelics. <laughs> and I came across it and I went, this is it. This is perfect. This is what I want to say. Um, and so she has defined this term. She's coined this new concept to basically think about the complex epistemic status of cognitive states, cognitive processes that clearly are irrational in some sense or epistemically suboptimal. They have some epistemic risks or deficits or flaws but they also have these significant epistemic benefits that you can't get um, any other way. And so one of her examples is um, so-called motivated delusions or defensive delusions. So things like um, anosognosia, the denial of illness, or, you know, various other conditions where people hold delusions that seem to play or, you know, that have been argued to play a psychologically protective role to sort of right. protect the person from facing the terrible truth and undergoing total despair or sort of psychological collapse. And Lisa just points out that, look, you know, if these states really are playing this role, this defensive or protective psychological role, well, obviously they've got epistemic costs, right? They're delusions, they're false or implausible beliefs, but they therefore have psychological benefits. They're helping the person retain their sort of psychological and social functionality. 
And her point is that that in turn is going to have flow on epistemic benefits because a lot of the ways in which we gain knowledge about the world have to do with exercising our psychosocial functionality, right? Exploring the world, taking an interest in it, talking to other people, exposing our beliefs to scrutiny and so on. So she's pointing out that, you know, there is a real and significant epistemic benefit that you get through having this imperfect cognitive state that you couldn't at that time get any other way, that you couldn't get via any less epistemically costly alternative. Right. And so that's going to turn out to be part of your defense of, uh, of, of these kinds of experiences, which I think is really cool. And we're going to get to that. But before we do, <clears throat> I want to talk a little bit about the things that you say kind of leading up to that, because uh, so we've sort of dealt with the let's take uh, the metaphysical stuff seriously. So you think there's a good case for naturalism. I tend to agree. Um, and also, though, you think that you have a debunking explanation, which is going to be part of the part of the defense here. Um, but there's a couple of, so first of all, I think that it's part, it's importantly part of your defense that you argue that, well, these, the, the metaphysical part of the experiences isn't really a great candidate for what's doing the therapeutic work. Um, yeah. so, so what, what, what's your reasons for thinking that? And so what is doing the therapeutic work? Yeah, so basically, um, there's a lot of really great, great qualitative evidence uh, where people have, you know, researchers have interviewed the participants in these studies, uh, the patients who have had these experiences. And what you find is really interesting, you find, and these are people who have been successfully treated, who have had good outcomes, and therefore, by inference, they must have had this mystical type experience or something like it. They've satisfied the psychometric criteria. And yet, when the researchers interview them, they're not talking about, I became one with the universe. And, you know, I realized that I am identical to the birthless, deathless, timeless, absolute. And that gave me great kind of fortitude in the face of my impending demise. I mean, some of them say something a little bit like that. And some of them are talking about, you know, an encounter with God or a union with God or a vision of a deity. But you get these other things that come up much more consistently, which are things like a sense of connectedness, right? So obviously, mm -hmm. that's kind of related to the sense of unity and the mystical type experience, but it needn't be unity with any kind of divine reality or cosmic consciousness. In a lot of cases, it's just a sense of feeling profoundly connected to other people, to all of life to everything on earth to the cosmos the natural world as such um, people are talking about psychological insights or experiences of autobiographical reframing kind of coming to understand um, things in their own life aspects of their own personality and psychology people are talking about um, emotional catharsis intense emotional experiences and coming to accept and feel their full range of emotions all the way from kind of um, fear and terror to sadness and despair and you know things that they previously would avoid or shut out so people are talking about all these sorts of things and you don't really get this clear signal coming through that what is doing the work is having a newly acquired or strengthened belief in the existence of some transcendent metaphysical reality and so my reasoning is really simple it's just that when people do have that classic sort of mystical experience where they do kind of experience oneness with the the timeless absolute the cosmic consciousness they talk about it right they really rave on and on about yeah. it um, and so uh, my thought was if these people were having that kind of experience they would be talking about it and since they're not we can conclude they might be having something that shares some elements with that but my thought is that basically these psychometric constructs of mystical type experience and oceanic boundlessness from the fact that those sort of psychometric boxes have been ticked you can't infer that someone has actually had a classic mystical experience in the sense of union with some divine reality that was felt to be kind of undeniably or unquestionably real instead it could be some other experience that caused them to tick these boxes to a certain extent and this comes through really clearly when you read um Michael Pollan's book on this because um, you know he was a naturalist before his psychedelic experiences and he remained one after but he had this experience on psilocybin mushrooms that when he filled out the questionnaire it, it satisfied the criteria it was a as he put it, according to the scientists, I had had a mystical experience. Um, but he talks about it and he had this experience of ego dissolution, the loss of the sense of self. And he felt his kind of sense of individuality merge into this um, cello suite that he was listening to. And he kind of experienced this, had this experience of looking at life and death from the vantage point of a, a consciousness or a kind of way of looking at the world that is not identified, that doesn't have this sense that, I am this bounded individual persistent entity, right? So there was right. some kind of 
metaphysics in there, but it's a metaphysics that I would say is perfectly consistent with naturalism. And he basically said that, you know, this helped him to understand how you get this phenomenon of people kind of ticking the boxes for a mystical type experience, but still staying atheists. It's because what is relevant and what is therapeutic and what is transformative about these experiences isn't necessarily the belief in a, a, another metaphysical reality. Right. I, didn't he also say about that, though, that that he thought maybe this suggested that this was a bad way of uh of determining what mystical experiences are since he said he had one according to the criteria but he didn't really feel like it was one no he said that of one of his other experiences he oh, okay. also had this yeah he had this really intense experience on 5-MeO DMT which is a very potent naturally occurring psychedelic that often people smoke and it's kind of zero to oblivion in um, 10 seconds and uh, right. people often talk on, on this drug about having these real sort of unity of pure consciousness type experiences. And basically Michael Pollan had a really bad experience. It was kind of terrifying ego dissolution on 5-MeO-DMT, but he still found it just sort of scraped over the line for the MEQ questionnaire. And that's when I he see. said, well, look, yeah, that instrument is not a good good net for capturing the 5-MeO-DMT experience, but he seemed pretty happy with it with respect to his psilocybin experience. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I got those two confused. Like, Cause that was the one he was talking about is like sense of self was blown away, like a house on bikini atoll or something like that. That's yeah, the DMT exactly. experience. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so I want to come, yeah. come back to that because there's an interesting philosophical point about whether you can have selfless consciousness. So I want to make sure that we get the chance to talk to that. Um, but going back to this, this issue right here. So um, I, I wonder if there's any, uh, background correlation to your previous beliefs. So Michael Pollan was a, a naturalist beforehand. Uh, he continues to be one. So I wonder if some of these people have these, I mean, not everyone, obviously, some people are like pretty staunch, you know, ordinary persons and they have these experiences and say, oh, you know, idealism is true, there's a consciousness. But I wonder if like these really union with God types of experiences, uh, can they be predicted by, by your past religiosity, so to speak? Yeah, good question. I would love to know. I mean, I know there was one study in Healthy Volunteers by Roland Griffiths and Co. at Johns Hopkins where they specifically recruited people who um, had some kind of interest in religious or spiritual practice. And I think from memory, maybe there was a higher rate of mystical type experience in that than in other comparable studies. But as far as I know, there's just not a lot of, um, uh, it hasn't really been studied rigorously empirically yet. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, as you say, it's important to realise that it's not going to be a perfect correlation. There are these really striking stories where people are staunch atheists, materialists, naturalists, and they become, you know, have, have one psychedelic experience and become an idealist or whatever. But right. yeah, I would, I would not be surprised if there was some correlation. Yeah. I mean, people, people are making the same point about there's a couple of recent studies showing increases in things like nature relatedness, um, you know, the sense of relate, being related to nature or connected to nature after a, a psychedelic experience and others showing decreases in authoritarian political leanings. And this is the response that a lot of people have is, you know, is this just bringing out tendencies that were already there, especially given the likely personality profile of people who are going to volunteer for these studies. And I think that probably accounts for some of it, whether it accounts for all of it. Um, I don't know, but yeah. Yeah, because I mean, you might think something, I mean, so I had a similar kind of thought about the beneficialness of these therapies is like, maybe there's a selection uh, bias going on here. The people who volunteer for the study might be already people who could benefit from it. So, um, it, I don't, is there, I mean, is there a, a kind of study that's just true double blind random selection? I mean, that would be hard to, to really get. There's always going to be a volunteer kind of thing going on. Exactly. Yeah. There are kind of, there are problems you just can't ever ethically get around here because people always have to consent. They always have to volunteer. I mean, I think we're going to see more information as more studies and bigger studies are conducted as these phase three studies of psilocybin, because just by the numbers, if you have to recruit hundreds upon hundreds of volunteers across multiple study sites, you're just of necessity going to get a bit more psychological and ideological diversity. But yeah, there's still always going to be that fun fundamental limitation that you can only study the effects of psilocybin on people who want you to study the effects of psilocybin. On right. <laughs> but is there, have there ever been any studies that, um, that uh, double blind the choice of hallucinogen. So you, you're getting one, but you don't know if it's psilocybin or LSD or uh, have they have yeah. done those kind of studies? 
Yeah, there have been some. Um, I don't know about, so I think there were one or two back in the 60s and 70s where they blinded the choice of classic psychedelics, so yeah, psilocybin, LSD, and so on. Um, I tried to track one of them down. I remember reading one like that ages ago, and I tried to track it down the other day, but couldn't. Um, in the modern era, I'm not aware of any like that, but there have been ones where they've double blind um, compared classics and contrast classic psychedelics with other drugs. There are some where they um, so there's a recent one where they did um, LSD, MDMA, and um, some kind of straight amphetamine, methamphetamine or something. There was another one, I think, back in the 90s where they did something similar with psilocybin, um, amphetamine, and it wasn't MDMA, but it was another entactogen, another very similar drug to MDMA. So, yeah, yeah. but none in the recent research that uh, double blind compare one serotonergic psychedelic to another that I'm aware of. Yeah, interesting, because we might think that the um, phenomenology is is different between the cases and we might get different effects, especially with related to natureness and stuff like that. But uh, yeah, so that's interesting. Um, but so I, I think there's an interesting case. So I think what we were talking about previously to get us sort of back on that track was that there's an interesting case to be made. I think I was convinced by it, actually, by reading your book that the, the uh, metaphysical, the comforting delusion part it's not really clear that those things are doing the therapeutic work. Um, yeah. But then there's the, the flip side of that, which is that you might think that the phenomenology itself doesn't play any role in doing that. It may be some kind of molecular, you know, uh, thing. The phenomenology comes along for free, but it's not really the, the sort of vehicle for driving the change. Um, yeah. And that is a kind of response that you find in the literature, right? Yeah. And yeah, so Absolutely. And your argument against that sort of approach is... Um... Yeah, is, is basically just the robust correlation between this specific type of experience and the lasting benefits. I mean, it might seem a bit naive or simplistic, but I just don't really see how you can account for that um, on the kind of pure, the view that it's all due to just like molecular level processes of neuroplasticity, because if that were the case, I would have thought that the effect you should get should be strictly dose dependent. It shouldn't kind of depend on what particular profile of subjective effects you happen to get on any given administration, which as we know, does vary quite a lot, but there is this uh -huh. strong correlation. It's when you get this experience where the sense of self dissolves and you have some kind of insight and feeling of connectedness, why would that be? Why would that correlation exist if um, it were all going on at some kind of sub-experiential level? And I think there's more you can say. I mean, I focus specifically on that in the book, but I mentioned in passing the fact that that's really consilient with other things we know, right? So for instance, we know that intense um, experiences, intense conscious experiences can have lasting and dramatic psychological effects can reconfigure personality and the obvious um, proof of concept is PTSD. So some people call psychedelic therapy a kind of inverse PTSD. It's a kind of incredibly <laughs> overwhelmingly intense emotional experience, but the valence is positive. And so similarly, it's so intense, it's so memorable. You keep going back, you keep revisiting it and that profoundly restructures your psychology, but in this case for the better. And so given that the experience that's induced is described, you know, people very often rate these experiences among the five most personally meaningful and spiritually significant events of their lives. And they right. say this was as important to me as being with my parent when they died or the, the birth of my first child or something like that. So it almost beggars belief that you could think an experience like that wouldn't have some profound lasting psychological effect. I mean, that's not to say there isn't some uh, part of the effect that's being caused outside consciousness as well, but you, you would just expect sort of a priori, as it were, that if you induce an experience like that, that's going to have psychological effects. And then you've also got the fact that, you know, naturally occurring, spontaneously occurring, non-drug induced mystical experiences, near death experiences are all, I mean, it's anecdotal, you can't study it in a controlled way really, but are all widely reputed to have these transformative effects. There are so many stories of people kind of right. just completely turning their lives around after having one of these experiences spontaneously. So I, I wonder, you don't talk about this specifically that I remember in the book, but I wonder about the, if there's any work done on the so-called micro dosing um, which, you know, was, I, I guess, semi-popular amongst certain people for a little while, like enhancing creativity. You take just a little bit. You don't feel like the experience or anything like that. But uh, so the, the because one the, what made me think of that was that the evidence that you talk about that this is kind of dose independent. So some people who take a moderate dose, they have this transcendent experience. They have benefits. Some people take a large dose. They have this. Some people take a large dose, they don't have that experience, so then they don't see the, the benefits. Uh, 
So what seems to be relevant there is the experience independent of the amount of dosage that you have. But I wonder if you could have, you know, if you microdose, you don't notice any effects at all and you have some benefit, then that might be an argument against the uh, phenomenology working. So I wonder if there's anyone that's ever looked at that or something along those lines. Yeah, so I mean, um, double blind RCTs of microdosing are only just starting to come out. I think there's maybe two that have been published now. I have sort of looked at them in passing, but I haven't really um, paid that much attention to microdosing yet. I think because until recently, I just really was very agnostic as to whether it was just a placebo effect or not. Right. Um, now, what the new studies seem to show is that it's not. There do seem to be real effects from these like really low doses, like 10 micrograms of LSD. I can't remember offhand exactly what they were. I think there was some kind of profile of mix you know some like increase in creativity but also a slight increase in anxiety or something like that but yeah i mean um if you certainly if you got comparable therapeutic effects from um, a micro dose and from a mystical type experience um, that would be remarkable that would be mind-blowing but then if you didn't that wouldn't really tell you anything because obviously the dose is so different um, right so. The person, the non-experientialist, if you will, the person who thinks the um, therapeutic effects are not experientially mediated is not going to be impressed by that. They would predict that. Um, right. Yeah. So to really test this, then it seems like really kind of difficult because what you have to do is somehow induce the cellular molecular changes without the experience. Um, right. And so that what seems I'm... like almost like not, if not impossible, extremely difficult. Right. So what I'm really interested in is there was a study um, published a couple of years ago in which it was shown that all these classic psychedelics have these kind of um, immediate pro neuroplasticity effects in cultured mammalian neurons. Um, they kind of promote the growth of dendritic arbors and all these things. And um, there's this drug that has been a sort of uh, puzzle for a while because it's a selective serotonin 2A agonist, like the classic psychedelics, but it's not psychedelic. It you know, seems to have barely any psychoactive effects. And my understanding of the current thinking on that is that they recruit different intracellular signaling pathways. So they kind of mm. bind to the same receptor in different ways and cause a different pattern of responses inside the neuron. And that's what then leads to changes in neuronal behavior that cause a trip and those that don't. Um, but as far as I can tell, I don't know if this is right or not, but as far as I can tell, this other drug, Lyceride, hasn't been studied to see if it has these pro-neuroplastic effects. And if it did, that would be great because that would then make that um, a relevant control, you know, and if you could get, um, if it had those same pro-neuroplastic um, effects at the cellular molecular level, then you could do a double-blind trial comparing and contrasting that with psilocybin or LSD. And if it was just as therapeutic, that would be a strong kind of blow for the non-experiential hypothesis right yeah that's yeah that would be interesting because it's it'd be not i mean it'd be nice if there was something like that because i was thinking in the case of like cannabis we have the thc and then also the uh the cbd so yeah, we can yeah, just, yeah. we can separate those two out and say oh well the psychoactive effects of uh of cannabis can be separated from these beneficial effects that you get from just the cbd oil um and it would be nice if there was something like that for the classic hallucinogens and it's so maybe this might be a possible route towards that indeed yeah yeah i mean if that turns out not to be the case then i don't know what you do it yeah it is you know it's an issue i'd like to do more work on actually from a philosophy of science standpoint like looking at um, issues to do with um interlevel mechanisms and interlevel causal relations and so on because it's just it's such a knotty issue to think about and it's so hard to figure out what would be a kind of killer experiment what would be a decisive test <laughs> yeah okay but so let's let because like, i i find myself relatively convinced by the fact that it's the that the phenomenology is doing some work i think as you say it's it would be almost like a shock to uh common sense if you had those kinds of experiences that didn't have some psychological effect uh, just right. seems com completely out of line with our ordinary notion of experience so if that's the case, and if it's not the really, you know, oneness with God and the universe part that's doing the work, then there's got to be some other aspect of it that's doing the work. You emphasize connectedness and so forth. But I think central to the kind of idea you have is that it has to do with the self, um, yeah, a kind exactly. of re reorganizing or reconceptualizing of, of the self itself. Yeah. Um, yeah. So can you tell us a little bit about how, how you think this works? Sure. Yeah. So basically, um, well, it ties in with a, a model. So there's a model of um, psychedelic action that's recently been proposed by Robin Carhart Harris and Carl Friston, and they call it the Rebus model. And it, so it's formulated in the context of this hierarchical predictive coding or predictive processing theory. And, um, you know, a lot of the details are not really that, that essential, but it's basically the idea that 
the brain, the mind maintains this hierarchically structured model of the world and lower levels kind of model more immediate concrete um, features. And then the higher up you get, the more sort of abstract uh, it is and the larger the spatiotemporal scales are. Um, and their model basically is that um, most of the kind of distinctive and important effects of psychedelics come from decreasing the brain's confidence in the highest levels and most abstract levels of this model. So it's most fundamental domain general beliefs about self and world. And so these are going to be things like, you know, I exist as an entity distinct from other things. Um, objects exist in space and time. Objects interact causally, you know, all these really fundamental categories of experience. Right. And right off the bat, you can see why that um, would be a really attractive explanation of the mystical type experience, because the kind of criteria for that sort of map really neatly onto what we would think of as, you know, the most fundamental or abstract parts of our reality models. Um, but yeah, I mean, and my Weebus, thought uh, stands for relaxed belief under psychedelics. So yes. the idea is that you loosen these priors and then you have these sorts of, you can come to these beliefs, I guess. I mean, that was part of my question that I was going to ask is why the focus on belief as opposed to experience, but maybe you're going to talk about that. But the idea is that you have these, you're, you're able to believe these things, which the model wouldn't allow you to believe previously. That's right. And you can let in kind of new sources of evidence that previously the model would have just um, dismissed. And so it's all got to do with this kind of Bayesian idea that, you know, in fixing the content of experience, there is this balance between um, top down prior expectations and bottom up input or error signals. Um, so, you know, the case that people often love to talk about, which is really great, is the hollow mask illusion, right? Yes. So you view a mask of a human face in the, I can never, for some reason, convex and concave, I always get them mixed up. <laughs> Um, yes, yeah, so I always say pointing face. in, pointing out. Yeah, whatever. Yeah, that's that, I mean, that's the way to do it. I'm just going to do that from now on. So you view a mask of a human face in the pointing in orientation. Um, it's got to be concave, doesn't it? Because it's like a cave. Um, yeah, there you go. <laughs> you view a mask of a human face in the concave orientation, but it pops out and you see it as convex. And the explanation is that your brain is so confident, it has such a heavily weighted prior belief that human faces are convex, that it just ignores the sensory evidence to the contrary, right? So there's always this balance between how confident am I in the prior belief and how confident am I in the driving input signal, the error signal, the source. So it's kind of the brain is constantly sort of meta representing the reliability of all of its own sources of information, whether they be top down prior expectations or, or bottom up kind of signals from the world. And so the thought is that um, this sort of dynamic can explain you know, it's not proposed as kind of a unifying theory or whatever, but that this kind of can account for a lot of what goes on in a lot of psychiatric pathologies. So if someone is addicted, then, you know, the further and further they go into this particular sense of who they are, um, the less and less they become able to um, really attend to or take seriously information that conflicts with that. And they might, right. you know, so Hannah Pickard has just published a paper on this on addiction and the self. Phil Gerens, my colleague, um, talks about this a lot as well, that, you know, often an addict is really unable to simulate vividly for themselves and really kind of connect with it this sense of a possible future that doesn't involve um, addiction to this substance or this behavior or whatever. And of course, the phenomenon is very familiar from um, things like depression and anxiety. These conditions are characterized by these core beliefs about the self that I am unworthy, that life is hopeless or meaningless, or that, you know, I'm constantly under threat. Um, and these beliefs, because they're kind of heavily weighted beliefs about the self, the brain assigns a high degree of confidence to them. And therefore, it just goes around kind of ignoring or dismissing or reinterpreting contrary evidence. And once this gets entrenched, it becomes this totally circular self-fulfilling prophecy, whereby, you know, evidence that would break through and kind of, um, uh, you know, undermine this belief is just so it's like, as I say in the book, it's like Hume's kind of argument that we can't take miracles seriously. We can't believe right. reports of miracles because our evidence for the inviolability of natural law is so strong that we can just ignore any testimony to the contrary. And the thought is that this is what the addicted, the anxious, the depressed brain is doing all the time. It's saying, basically, I know I'm so sure that I'm... Um, unworthy or that I'm under threat or whatever, that I can just refuse to take seriously any evidence that I might be worthy or that I might be safe or loved or, or whatever. 
And right. so, yeah, then the story is that, that psychedelics break that open. They go in there and kind of undermine the brain's confidence in its fundamental hypotheses, including hypotheses about who and what and how I am. Um, and that then um, allows room for all these sorts of things that people describe in qualitative studies, kind of reconnecting with their old sort of long forgotten values, um, you know, reconnecting with a sense of themselves as worthy and lovable, reconnecting with kind of um, hobbies and pursuits and friends and parts of their personality that they'd forgotten, having this new sense of who they are, letting go of the old me as an addict or the old me as a smoker and having a new me as a non-smoker, all these kind of changes to people's fundamental self-conception. Right. So I, there, there was a interesting, you quote this guy in the book who says, you know, I felt like I died as a smoker and I was, I came back as a non-smoker and that's kind of like encapsulates a basic the thing you're saying, which is that they can, they revisualize themselves in a way that they couldn't previously because of these priors. Right. And it's interesting how many people describe the psychedelic experience in those terms as a death and rebirth experience. There's one that I'll never forget from the, the 60s, this book by Masters in Houston, The Varieties of Psychedelic Experience, and it was this guy who was just suicidally depressed and he was basically, he was going to do it. He had made his plans to take his own life before, so it's a while since I read it now, but somehow or other he, um, you know, ended up having this LSD session and as he described it, it was a total death and rebirth. And that old person who wanted to die did die and he said afterwards that in some sense that needed to happen one way or the other um, that wow. person who he was before was going to die and then once that had happened then he could be somebody else um, wow that's that's yeah that's powerful um yeah. I, I wonder if i could ask a question about the hollow face illusion since you brought that up um because there is some there's evidence that shows that uh so people pr consciously perceive the the nose as coming towards them as, as uh convex um, but if you ask them to reach out and touch the nose, they they reach into the mask and touch the back. They don't touch where the nose appears. Mm, um, so so they're getting the visual information, um, sensing the the place of where the actual nose is. But because the priors are so high about the ordinary shape of faces, that kind of is overridden, and they sort of experience it as pointing towards them. Um, so now I wonder. So if this. So if taking that. And the idea that uh, hallucinogens relax these fundamental priors, should one predict that you would experience the, the lose the illusion under hallucinogenics? And does that I mean, happen? It seems like you do. The data have not been published yet, but um, as I understand it, there are unpublished data showing that people on psilocybin are less susceptible to the hollow mask illusion, yeah. Interesting, yeah. okay. So then that would, that would be pretty good evidence that some of these fundamental priors are being relaxed. Yeah, it's one of the most, um, I'm actually in a reading group here in Australasia, we've got a few people interested in psychedelic science, and we're meeting every fortnight to read various papers. And we were looking just this morning at this, this paper, the Carhart Harrison Frist and Rebus paper and looking at all the evidence. And that is one of the findings, even though, yeah, I mean, it hasn't been published yet, but I find that really compelling. Um, yeah. Right. And binocular rivalry as well, um, you know, the fact that people on psychedelics, um, I think that some of the results are a little bit mixed. It's not totally consistent across all the studies, but in general, the pattern seems to be you get longer periods of uh, mixed percepts. So again, it seems like you've got less kind of dominance of, of top-down assumptions that you can't have two objects in the same place at the same time. Right. Yeah, that's interesting. Um, do, do any of these ideas, do you feel like they put pressure on the predictive coding model? Um, so uh, if, if the, if what's, well, I don't know, anyway, can you, so before I ask this question, can you tell us about predictive processing in general and what it, what about it, where is the experience supposed to be generated from in terms of predictive processing? Yeah, so that's a hell of a question. So I should yes. say, just to start out, um, I, I, I'm not au fait with the technicalities at all. I don't understand the maths. Uh, my grasp of the theory is uh, what we might politely call conceptual. Um, but yeah, my understanding is <laughs> very close to what I said before, that you've got this kind of hierarchical model of the world. Um, different layers are trying to model what's going on at different levels of abstraction. And each layer is trying to generate top-down predictions of what's going to happen in the layer below. And so together they kind of conspire to generate this prediction of the, the next moment of sensory input. Um, and yeah, the thought is that, um, you know, for efficiency's sake, from an evolutionary standpoint, um, processing is driven only by error signals. So any incoming signal that is successfully predicted is just cancelled out. It doesn't go any further up the hierarchy. Right. It's only the differences that are 
sent up. And so then, yeah, I take it this is where you're about to go. This kind of leads to this question of what actually is the, the basis of phenomenal experience. And people have these different stories. I take it the two basic options on offer are um, the content of experience is fixed by the content of the models and the content of experience is, is just the error. Is that, those are pretty much the options that people talk about, right? Right. Yeah. So, uh, so what, so, and often you hear, well, uh, what is the model, I guess would be one question, because why would it be, why wouldn't it be the prediction of these kinds of theories that you get an experience at every level? So I, I'm curious about what would drive you to identify it with the highest level besides like, you know, uh, pre-theoretical concerns. It doesn't seem to be anything in the theory would suggest that's the right to, I, to identify what with the highest level. Oh, sorry. Oh, sorry. You just, sorry. You just cut out. Sorry about that. Oh, good. Oh, yeah. Good. Sorry. Um, yeah, sorry, you were just saying uh, the pressure to identify it with the highest level, to, to identify what, to say that you only get experience from the highest level of the yeah. model. Who right. says that? Well, so where, so what's where in the model is uh, the experience, the content of the experience generated? I mean, I, I, I've, I've tended to assume it's at all levels. Oh, it is at all levels. I could be wrong. Is there a standard story about this? I, I assume that it's at all levels. As I say, I know there are kind of divergent opinions. Um, I, who, who says that it's just at the top level? Uh, yeah, well, I, I, may, I mean, I thought um, people like Jakob Howey, I'm probably misattributing this to him now that I'm thinking about it. But uh, yeah, so I that mean, surprises might, me. Yeah, no, I'm, you I'm might be right. I mean, so definitely now that I think about it, there are parts of Carhart, Harris and Friston that read that way because they sort of say that, you know, there's this whole line that in, in predictive processing, higher levels tell lower levels to shut up. Um, you know, they kind of, they're trying to quash the, the driving signal. And in places, Carhart, Harris and Friston do seem to be talking about that as though, yeah, the higher levels, one way they put it is they compress the lower levels. Um, mm -hmm. Trying to remember the exact language they use. But now that you say that, yeah, there is there's definitely things they say and there's language they use that could be taken to be suggestive of that. And I mean, I guess that would explain the whole idea because they talk about, you know, how you get this expanded emotional experience under psychedelics and they sort of say, well, this comes from the relaxation of high level priors. I mean, I guess that would make sense on a story according to which normally you're sort of suppressing the the limbic activity by predicting it successfully and so then it doesn't come into awareness and then it's um when you can't predict it successfully anymore it comes into awareness so yeah okay right. i mean maybe maybe that is the position that's there in rebus um yeah i hadn't thought about it too much i had just had always assumed that the default options were either it's the content of the model and then i thought of that as at all levels which of course doesn't mean every part of the model at all levels i assume there was still going to be some consciousness making property that demarcates the conscious from the unconscious bits of the model but yeah i would kind of had thought of the the standard assumptions as either it's just the models at all levels um or it's the error signal because that's another view that i've heard some people propound is that you only consciously experience the error yeah uh because uh, yeah all right so i i have to uh, admit that predictive processing as a theory of consciousness is something that I struggle to really come to understand. Um, but well, so uh, my understanding it's, it's not a theory of consciousness, which I think is, is an important point, which um, I see it being referred to as such quite often, but on my understanding, it's not, it's a theory of cognitive architecture or of cognitive right. processing, but it doesn't in itself have anything to say about what makes uh, mental models or mental representations phenomenally conscious. Oh, I see. Okay, because I, I think some people want to read it as giving you an account of that. Uh, although I understand that it's primary, it was primarily introduced as just a theory of cognitive functioning, uh, or yeah. even as just a theory of the brain itself. Um, but right. but I do think that people like Jakob and maybe Andy, uh, Andy Clark, um, take it to give an account of conscious experience that kind of falls out uh, of this. Well, okay. So yeah, I mean, I definitely think it gives you an account of the contents of consciousness, um, but I don't think it's a theory of consciousness in the sense in which global workspace theory or IIT or whatever is. I, I don't take it to be. I know Jakob is doing some work at the moment. I don't know anything about the content of it, but I know he's doing some work on specifically on predictive processing and consciousness. Um, so maybe this is the goal to create a predictive processing theory of what makes mental states phenomenally conscious or what demarcates phenomenally conscious from phenomenally unconscious ones. But yeah, I am. Um, 
Yeah, I guess I, I didn't think people really thought that it, it kind of gave you an answer to that question. I don't think it okay. does. Okay, so, so you took it that it gives you an answer to what the contents of uh, conscious experience might be, but then you need an account of why certain contents are conscious. Yeah, yeah, something like that, yeah. Okay, uh, yeah, yeah. yeah, okay, good. But even even on that understanding, I guess I still have a version of my question, which is why you would expect the contents to be modified in the way that they are. So why is it the high level priors that become relaxed? Why not low level priors? So why isn't there something about the sensory processing that has changed as opposed to these, you know, the, the, the fundamental assumptions about reality? Yeah, yeah. So, okay. So you're getting at a lot of interesting and unresolved issues here because one apparent problem for the Rebus model is on low dose psychedelic experiences, you just sort of get um, geometric or visual hallucinations and you don't tend to get these more intense effects on selfhood and emotion and so on. Um, but those hallucinations, I mean, there's a lot of work at the moment that explains hallucination in terms of overly strong priors. So Phil Corlett and people like this have all this experimental and theoretical work suggesting, and it's very intuitive, of course, like it seems to be this hallmark of the psychedelic state that you get this kind of pareidolia all over the place, sort of perceiving patterns right. and random data. And that seems like strengthened rather than weakened priors. Um, so there is a puzzle here and there's, you know, Carhart, Harris and Friston say something about this in the Rebus paper, but I don't know if there's sort of a fully satisfactory resolution. I mean, part of the answer that they give, um, and I have to defer to them um, on this, um, is that basically this is where the serotonin 2A receptors are densely expressed. So in a number mm. of papers, Carhart, Harris has said you, you get these. So I know that these uh, are most densely expressed on the apical dendrites of layer five pyramidal cells, uh, but in terms of the specific regions um, in a number of papers, Carhart Harris says, well, they're most densely concentrated in these kind of higher level multimodal um, association areas. And so that would explain why you're having effects on the high level rather than the low level priors. Then on the other hand, you know, my understanding is they're also pretty densely expressed in visual areas, which sort of would explain why you get these visual effects, but not why, as you say, the visual effects seems to be one's so, I mean, here's one answer you can give to the question, right? And I don't think it works. Um, I think this is part of what they say in the paper is, well, you've got this processing hierarchy and, you know, in the book, I liken it to a Quinean web of belief, the sort of higher, most abstract layers are kind of really densely connected. And so if you um, mess with the higher levels, that's going to have kind of far reaching and unpredictable effects throughout the whole hierarchy. And that seems basically right. And so I think in the paper, they say something like, well, if you weaken the higher level priors, that's then going to stop them having their usual constraining influence on the lower levels. And so then you could get kind of lower level priors priors becoming stronger than they should be because they're not being regulated by the high level hyper priors, the priors on priors. And as far as it goes, that seems right, but that still doesn't account for this phenomenon as far as I can see where you have the low dose trip with mostly visual or perceptual effects. And it's there's no obvious kind of phenomenological signs of weakening high level priors. Um, right. I mean, you know, maybe you could just say they're being weakened very subtly, only enough to kind of relax their effect on on visual priors, but not enough to really dissolve the sense of self. But. And, and you don't ever, uh, I mean, maybe sometimes you do, but do, is there evidence that you get a kind of cross modal effect um, under high doses of hallucinogenics so that you maybe, I mean, people talk about, you know, hearing colors or sometimes, you know, anecdotally, but does that, is that reliably reproduced? Oh yeah, this is a very common psychedelic effect. Yeah, my understanding is it doesn't meet the criteria for synesthesia proper, but yeah, these cross-modal interactions are almost like kind of one of the, the main hallmarks of the psychedelic state. And the main one is um, uh, auditory visual. So when people are tripping and they're listening to this music, they have this inc these incredible visions that sort of move in time with the music and the content and the tone of the visions is strongly affected by, by the music. Um, yeah, that's the most common one. I think you get others as well. But. And, and so is this something that you think you can explain in terms of the rebus, like the relaxed beliefs? Yeah. I mean, again, in a very like abstract hand wavy level, it seems kind of intuitive that if you've got these um, high levels that kind of function as the uh, conductor of the orchestra, they kind of, uh, uh, you know, regulating the behavior of all the other systems throughout the brain, and then you start weakening them. And, you know, one important part of my story, of course, is that, beliefs about the self, so this self model, um, are importantly beliefs about what you care about. So they're beliefs about what right. matters to you, your hierarchy of goals and things like that. And so that's why there's this intimate connection between self modeling and um, 
salience and attention. So the self model, the different layers of the self model play this role in determining what you pay attention to. And that then regulates the way that is implemented is by regulating the patterns of functional connectivity between all these different neural networks. And to me, it seems really intuitive that, yeah, if that starts crashing down, um, then you're just going to have all these kind of chaotic, um, you know, un you know, unconstrained cognition is the term they use. You're going to have all these unconstrained kind of, um, chaotic effects ramifying throughout the rest of the system. You're going to get these effects that people observe of kind of new patterns of functional connectivity, networks talking to networks they don't normally talk to. And then it seems like, yeah, again, very intuitive and straightforward. You would have information flow. And so there have been studies that have shown really interesting things like, you know, increased information flow from medial temporal regions like the hippocampus to the visual cortex, correlating with kind of um, autobiographical visions and memory recall. Or, I don't know if it's precisely that, but really suggestive things where, you know, there's a correlation between increased crosstalk between certain systems and something on the phenomenal level that just is exactly what you would expect from um, that change, so. Yeah, interesting. And, and so this is, I mean, Kind of jumping around a little bit, but though this is a finding that you uh, that you get from psychedelics in like fMRI scanners is that you sort of naively you would expect that the brain was like just extremely hyperactive under these visual experiences, but we find a kind of decreased activity um, overall. Is that right, or is you're looking like that? You're skeptical about that? Yeah, I, I want to. I don't know what to say about this because yeah, this has been a sort of controversial point for a while, and. Um, some studies have been done to attempt to resolve it, but frankly, I don't fully understand what's going on in these studies. And so I can't really, I'm, I, I'm not honestly sure if that issue has been resolved to anyone's satisfaction because okay. yeah, there were all these pet studies in the 1990s that um, Franz Vollenweider and co were doing with psilocybin and they seem to show this increased metabolic activity, increases in glucose metabolism, particularly in all these frontal regions. Then Carhart, Harris and co started doing the fMRI studies and they seem to show decreases in all these regions, including default network regions under psilocybin. Um, I think there have been some other studies that have shown decreases, some other studies that have shown increases. I remember one, so one, one um, finding that seems to be pretty consistent is this desynchronization. So this weakening of the power of synchronous neuronal oscillations, especially in the alpha rhythm, the sort of eight to 13 Hertz frequency band, but I think in lower frequency bands in general, um, mm. that seems to be something that is pretty robust. And so one um, proposed reconciliation that I saw a few years ago was that maybe um, you're getting increased activity, but decreased synchrony. And so it's actually the synchrony, not the um, uh, level of overall activity that the bold signal, blood oxygen level dependent signal is measuring. And I they cited some other studies that seem to suggest that either that that's what the bold signal is really tracking or at least that you can get this kind of decoupling of metabolic activity from synchrony but yeah, yeah. i'm i'm pretty yeah. unsure what the state of play is in terms of do psychedelics increase or decrease overall brain activity okay interesting but the finding about the synchrony is it's or the these uh, various brain patterns is itself pretty interesting um given that we think the various roles that they play like you know alpha waves are sometimes implicated in various psychological functions like attention or something totally yeah yeah and i think some people have suggested i think Carhart, harris and friston definitely say this their idea is that the alpha rhythm encodes priors that's you know and that's why you get this alpha desynchronization these higher levels and that is what corresponds to the weakening of the priors Oh, interesting. Okay. Yeah. I wasn't aware of that. Um, okay. So you mentioned the default mode <clears throat> network and you also talk a lot about the salience network. <clears throat> so I wonder if you could just tell us a little bit about these networks and what, why you think they're important for your specific uh, way that you want to address the comforting delusion objection. Sure. Yeah. So, I mean, basically I, so the, the whole um, kind of um, response to the comforting delusion objection is just to say, look, you know, even if naturalism is true and even if the epistemic status of psychedelic therapy is important, it's still not that bad. And the reason is that basically, given naturalism, the epistemic status of psychedelic therapy is really pretty good. It's not as bad as it first appears. And then there are two strands to that. One is the epistemic risks aren't as bad as they look, so it doesn't really work by inducing these um, non-naturalistic metaphysical beliefs. And the other side is um, the epistemic benefits are greater than they might appear. And kind of giving a positive story about how it actually works, um, it bridges those two, right? So early in the book, I give the argument that it's not metaphysical belief changes that do the work, but it is some part of the experience there's something about the phenomenology and then to really I could just leave that there but then to make good on that I kind of really need a positive story of my own where how is it working if it's not 
A, low-level non-experiential changes to neuroplasticity or B, um, changes to metaphysical beliefs, what actually is the story? And so then um, giving a story there also is the springboard for the second part, kind of talking about the epistemic benefits. So yeah, and my story is um, it's all about changes to the sense of self, self-representation or self-modeling. And so um, then I kind of think we have to connect this. Well, first of all, my, my story that it's all to do with changes in the sense of self is justified by three distinct lines of evidence. Yeah, one of those has to do with the default mode and salience networks. So basically you've got um, a few studies um, where, so there are all these studies where some kind of construct of mystical type experience or oceanic boundlessness predicts the positive uh, results, kind of um, symptom reduction increases in well-being. But there are a few studies, just a few, where um, a stronger predictor is actually some kind of experience of psychological insight. So having some right. kind of autobiographical insight into one's problems or seeing oneself differently, getting a new perspective on one's own life. So that's kind of my first um line of evidence that it's all about changes to the sense of self. You combine that with the fact that this sense of unity, dissolution of the sense of self is a hallmark of the mystical experience anyway, and that sort of seems to be a strong candidate. Um, second, you've got all these studies showing increases in uh, these mindfulness capacities, capacities for kind of taking a, a detached or at least a sort of non-reactive, um, open, curious stance on one's inner experience, one's own thoughts and feelings. Um, and also studies showing increases in the construct of psychological flexibility, which seems to me to be very similar to mindfulness capacities. Again, the kind of, you know, feeling of, of willingness to have different experiences and to not identify strongly with one's experiences or be right. distressed by one's mental contents. And that to me clearly involves changes in the sense of self. So it's kind of changing, you're disidentifying with mental contents and seeing them as more of a spectator or an observer. So there's those two. And then the third line of evidence is, yeah, as you say, um, the fact that all these studies that look at neural correlates um, of lasting therapeutic and transformative effects, they all find changes to one of these two neural systems, the default mode network and the salience network. And both of those are linked to self-representation, linked to self-modeling by a whole bunch of independent evidence in neuroscience and psychiatry. And so the simple story is, so there's this kind of distinction that, that people use between um, you know, the narrative self and the minimal or embodied self. And so the narrative right. self is, you know, my sense of being this specific individual persisting over time with a given personality and autobiography and so on. And then the minimal self, I mean, this obviously all gets a lot more complicated, but at a first pass, the minimal self is just the sense of being an experiencing subject here and now at this moment in time. Um, someone who is undergoing experience and um, yeah, the default mode network seems to be um, implicated in this narrative or autobiographical sense of self. It's involved in all these functions like theory of mind, so attribution of mental states, um, mind wandering in the task-free resting state, autobiographical reasoning, reasoning about one's own personality, all the sorts of things that seem like they would contribute to a kind of high level narrative or autobiographical um, conception of who one is. And there's um, evidence from lesion studies and so on that supports this as well, showing that people with lesions to components of this network have um, problems with autobiographical reasoning. Um, and then the salience network um, is sort of, that's kind of uh, less straightforward or less intuitive, but its function is supposed to be to detect kind of salient or relevant um, information across multiple modalities and play a role in kind of um, allocating processing resources, activating the right systems. Do we need to be paying attention inside or outside? Um, right. And part of the thought there is that it needs to represent a self in the process because it needs to kind of interpret these changes in the body, changes in the physiological milieu need to be modeled as kind of signals of the relevance of events to someone if this network is going to kind of um, look for relevant or important events and then um, kind of um, activate other systems kind of coordinate other systems accordingly then it needs to have a model of someone to whom events could be relevant to whom they could matter and so that's where you're supposed to get this yeah kind of minimal sort of emotional or embodied sense of self and so, and the evidence suggests that um, th that modifications of, of activity in these networks correlates with the loss of self, the, the ego dissolution and those sorts of things. 
Yeah, that's right. So if you just look at all the studies kind of looking at, um, you know, neural correlates of the psychedelic state in general, it's very messy. It's very heterogeneous. And really, in some ways, you should expect that because you've got different substances, different doses, different populations, different imaging methods. And we know um, that even when you hold all these factors fixed, the effects of these drugs on consciousness are highly variable. So that's really what you should predict. But um, yeah, all the studies, and I mean, I should say one kind of caveat is that in a lot of these studies, they've specifically specifically looked for this, right? So they have kind of regions of interest, but some of them they haven't. And in any case, um, every study that I know of that has looked at, yeah, either neural correlates of um, acute experience of ego dissolution during the drug effects, um, neural correlates of the experience of insightfulness during the drug effects, and um, neural correlates of lasting therapeutic and transformative benefits, every one of them has found some kind of change to the default mode or the salience network mm. or both. Yeah. Yeah. And so well, the, pre so the precise changes differ, but yeah. The, what say that again? Oh, sorry, I just said the precise changes differ. There's no incredibly kind of neat story, but yeah. Right, but generally speaking, there's differences in these areas. These areas correlate with our, or at least are implicated in these kind of narrative self. Um, and so, part of your defense then is that what's going on in these uh, cases that where the beneficial effects are found is this um, ego dissolution. We have reasons to think that it's the, the narrative self which is involved there. And so th then this kind of like triangulation of this is the important area, which explains why that's happening. I should say not ego dissolution specifically, right? So changes to the sense of self, but I think these can happen even when you don't have an experience that people naturally describe as the dissolution of the ego. So okay. someone might have a, a high dose experience and describe having kind of a new perspective on their life or an autobiographical insight or a sense of connectedness. And they won't necessarily say, I felt my sense of self dissolving or I was merging with the environment, which I think is, I mean, part of the problem is ego dissolution is not a well-defined term and people use it to mean different things, but if it means this experience of feeling the boundaries between yourself and the world dissolve in some kind of metaphysical sense, I think it's clear that that is not, um, not needed. Um, and so I'm definitely not saying that that's, even when that experience is happening, I don't think it's that experience per se. I think it's, you know, more, as you say, the narrative autobiographical um, stuff, the ability to um, see oneself differently, to have a new perspective right. on one's personality and one's life and so on. Yeah. But but it is fair to say, though, that even in those cases, the self is crucially involved because you're seeing yourself differently. You're having insight yes. to oneself, et cetera. Yeah, yeah. So it's totally about sort of taking the self model apart and putting it back together. It's just that that doesn't always induce a phenomenology that people would naturally describe as ego dissolution. And right. even when it does, that bit is not necessarily the most important part. I see. Right. So this is related to your self unbinding account, right? That uh, to yeah. what's happening is. So can you tell us, first of all, the, the notion of the self that's at play here, um, yeah. which is the self binding account and then the self unbinding. Yeah, yeah. So it's all in the context of um, hierarchical predictive processing again. And so I developed this um, account um, in collaboration with Philip Gerens. And really, I've got to say, he understands the technicalities a lot better than I do. Um, but yeah, Phil, um, I sort of uh, worked with him a bit when I was at Adelaide Uni, and he's done all this great work on... Um, you know, basically the neurophilosophy and the cognitive neuroscience of delusions and all of these different psychiatric conditions. Um, and so uh, we kind of created this account according to which, and it's partly based on the fact that there was this discrepancy in the neuroimaging findings. That some studies had found ego dissolution under psychedelics correlating with disintegration of the default mode network. So either reduction in um, activity of default mode network nodes or decreases in the connectivity within this network, but then other studies had shown changes to the salience network. And so our proposed resolution was that in the same way that um, according to predictive processing, the brain maintains a hierarchical model of the world in general we said the model of the self is also hierarchical and that basically it's kind of tracking um, information that relates to the self and tracking this self non-self distinction at all sort of levels of abstraction spatio-temporal scale so at the most basic embodied level it's keeping track of the bodily boundaries i'm in here the world is out here but then at slightly higher levels of abstraction you've got these kind of correspondences between changes in here and changes out there right so the fact that you know the heart rate does something when i encounter someone who has a particular significance to me or when I kind of, you know, basically when I encounter some situation outside of myself that has some significance for me, there are these consistent um, correlations between what's going on out there and what's going on in here. And so we said, well, 
at that level as well, the brain needs to kind of keep track of what's going on. And so it builds this model that says there's this entity that has particular goals and interests and it predicts and explains the changes in the internal milieu in terms of the hypothesis that events, well, but inside and outside, but events right. are relevant to the goals and interests of this entity. And then at higher levels still, it needs to kind of keep track of the really abstract patterns in this um, over the course of time in order to plan to enable social coordination and communication. And that's where you get this kind of narrative or autobiographical um, sense of self. And um, the reason we talked about binding is because, um, well, partly because there's all this work by Swee and Humphreys, these psychologists basically showing that, um, you know, there's this binding effect, sort of increased um, representational integration for information relating to the self. And it seems to be this robust effect across different sort of topics and different modalities and so on that information that is perceived as self-relevant is integrated or bound more efficiently and then it becomes harder to unbind afterwards and um Jakob Hovey has this really nice story because of course the binding problem is you know still unsolved there's no agreed upon theory of how does the brain integrate representational parts into representational holes but Jakob in his book has this great story about how it works on predictive processing, which is that basically because processing is inverted, because it's all driven from the top down, the binding problem sort of dissolves because the brain just assumes the existence of objects with properties, assumes bound attributes, and then kind of issues predictions on that basis. And so to the extent that um, the sensory evidence confirms what you would expect. So, you know, you kind of got the, the red ball bouncing and the model says there's a single object, it's the ball and it's both spherical and red. And so to the extent that those properties of redness and um, sphericality actually do co-occur, that reinforces the model. And so um, the idea there is that, yeah, this is a fundamental strategy whereby the brain kind of tracks the world and, you know, efficiently reduces prediction error and keeps track of what's going on is it populates the world with objects. It kind of creates yeah. this substance property relation ontology. And we thought that was a really kind of compelling way to think about what's going on with self-representation and what therefore changes in psychedelic experience. The idea that if this binding, this integration of all this information across different timescales and modalities into a representation of the self actually happens by this top-down postulation of this substantial object that kind of persists through time, um, then that would explain both a lot of kind of philosophical intuitions that you get in relation to thought experiments and also the phenomenology that people describe. Because, I mean, why are they talking about having my sense of self dissolve or feeling like I'm no longer a bounded entity distinct from the rest of the world unless they felt like they were one the rest of the time? Um, so, right. Yeah. I, I mean, on a minor note, that's not really related to your main proposal, but I, I do wonder about this claim about the binding problem because uh, maybe there's no universally accepted solution, but I sort of thought that like activity in the gamma range, you know, 40 hertz or uh, higher, high, uh, high frequency oscillations, at least, um, were widely thought to have at, at the potential to solve the binding problem. So that, you know, coming from the wolf, work of Wolf Singer and people like him, the idea, which I thought was kind of get, gaining popularity, but maybe I'm wrong about this, but I thought the idea was to be that different features that are firing in synchrony um, get bound together. Um, but so it sounds like part of what you're saying is that this isn't, um, or at least not as good an account of binding that you get from predictive processing, or are they compatible? Mm, good question. I don't really know what I think. I mean, I'm familiar with some of those early studies, like from the late nineties. I don't really know this more, more recent work. My understanding was there was really good evidence for that in like visual feature binding the, the 40 Hertz thing. Uh, is there, is there evidence for it that goes beyond sort of perceptual processing? Uh, yeah, that I don't think there that we that I'm aware of that there's great evidence for that. But at least in the in the in the visual perceptual case, I thought that this there was good evidence for that. Um, yeah, yeah. As far as I know, that's correct. Yeah. So I mean, the response is is two things. Is first of all, you know, that's a neural correlate. You still need to describe what the cognitive process is that's being implemented by that. So I don't see them as necessarily inconsistent. Um, right. Okay. You could say that you know this this kind of top down postulation of particulars is just what is being implemented when you have this. 40 hertz synchrony um, and the other thing is um, yeah I mean I'm talking obviously much more about kind of higher levels of like multimodal um, object binding and, and things like that so right. yeah, it's possible there are, there are different <clears throat> mechanisms operating yeah so and then more specifically about the predictive processing account of binding I guess I was a little bit confused about the it comes for free uh, line um, because, so I, I get the idea that the higher levels are making these predictions. The predictions are in terms of objects having properties um, that can be interpreted in that way. 
but I, I guess I still, and so what the idea is that they sort of force, well, I, I'm still not sure how they get bound or why we'd expect that they would make these kinds of predictions as opposed to the other ones, which just sort of seems like the binding problem in another guise, so to speak. Um, so I, I, maybe this, this doesn't, isn't really, I mean, you can still tell the story you want to tell, even if you don't care about this question, but I am guess I'm just a little bit generally confused about how the solution really is supposed to like nuts and bolts work. Sure. So, I mean, here's part of it. So tell me if this makes sense, right? So the way I understand it is that on the sort of older feed forward view, what might happen is you have some information comes in through the retina and then kind of you get some activity going on in visual cortex and you have like over here uh, a representation of some um, luminance and over here representation of an edge. And at some point you've got in kind of these relatively low perceptual areas separate anatomically separate representations of distinct perceptual features and then right. some system further up from that needs to kind of figure out well does this one belong with this one or does it belong with this one there's some kind of problem i mean so i can't remember who it is but it's been pointed out that you know the term binding problem is ambiguous there's the binding problem that theorists need to solve the question how does the brain do this and then there's the binding problem that the brain needs to solve the brain needs right. to kind of integrate these representations correctly. And obviously I'm using it now in the latter sense. So the brain has this kind of question to answer which um, features go with which other features. Um, whereas I take the advantage of doing it in the top down way. And obviously this only works once you've had a period of learning, once you've got some pretty robust kind of high level priors that constrain the sorts of models you're gonna have. And then immediately when you get certain sorts of um, inputs, you're gonna very rapidly, you know, you have the flood of prediction error and then very rapidly recruit kind of the best fit models. But the thought is that if the process is being driven from the top down, then my brain doesn't have to kind of look at the look at the redness and the sphericality and decide, well, does the redness go with the sphericality or does the redness go with the shape of the chair? It's already got a sort of model at higher levels saying, you know, because that's been selected, that's the one that kind of is, and maybe this is where you think that it's kind of cheating because yes. you've still got the flood of <laughs> prediction error that needs to recruit. So is that the worry that you still have yes. to, at some point, recruit the, the right model? Right. So and Yeah, I, okay, interesting. Yeah, I'm not really sure why, how, how you, I mean, you can build it in, but uh, it seems like it's, the, the coming for free part is, being paid for at an earlier level, uh, <laughs> at an earlier stage in the process, which kind of at this point, I'm not exactly sure why you would get that model as opposed to a different one. Mm. Um, and, uh, but anyway, so this is not really central to your main project. So maybe it's, it's not really relevant, but. Um, I hope not, because I don't have anything very profound to say about it. It's an interesting okay. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Yeah. So let's leave that aside then, because it, it was just kind of a passing thought, but um so let's get back to the idea that then, so what happens on your view is that, so you have this, the, the self-binding, which is you take the, by analogy, what's happening in the perceptual case and you say, okay, so you have a model of the self has these priors built into it. Um, and so that when those priors get relaxed, then you can come to view the self and have beliefs about the self, which you couldn't previously have. Um, yes. And so that's the unbinding part that different aspects of these will come apart. And I should say, you mentioned beliefs earlier. You said, well, why beliefs? Why not experiences? And I should say that I, when I talk about beliefs here, I'm interpreting that in a very broad sense. And I think this is okay. a really interesting issue because this, this comes up later in the book in the epistemology chapter, right? So, like, it's just a familiar phenomenon that we're capable of believing something in one sense while not believing it in another sense, right? This kind of dissociation. And so the common example is um, mortality, right? You know, we all know that we're going to die. We all readily assent to that proposition. But um, I know not everyone uh, agrees with this, but, you know, a lot of us think that there's some sense in which most of us, most of the time, don't really believe that that's going to happen to us, right? And it's only right. after we have a real scare, a brush with illness or something like that, that we finally get it. We really get that, oh, this is, and, you know, in, in some uh, strands of Buddhism, in traditional Buddhism, there are practices that are designed precisely to close this gap between mere intellectual belief and really feeling it in your bones. And I think yeah, this is one of the things that... Say. Grokking it, exactly, yeah. <laughs> and I think this is one of the things that psychedelics can do. This is part of the epistemic benefit. But I just have no idea what to say about this from a, a cognitive perspective, from the perspective of cognitive architecture. It just obviously is the case that there is more than one sense. There is more than one kind of mental state that we refer to as belief. There is more than one sense in which we believe things. And obviously when I'm talking about beliefs about the self that structure your experience, 
sometimes they might have a counterpart in your sort of explicit reflective beliefs. But most of the time I'm talking about stuff that is structuring models that are structuring your experience um, that are, you know, representations about the self, but might be kind of at odds with the, the explicit things that you would sort of intellectually assent to. Right. Um, yeah. So, yeah, there's, I, I noticed we're, I'm keeping you here for an extended period of time. So I hope you don't mind. I don't know if you have another 15 minutes or so to keep talking. Oh, about. definitely. I mean, uh, time has flown. I know I said I'd be able to do an hour, hour and a half, um, but I, it's partly just because I have to have dinner. It's 20 to 80. And I actually <laughs> had a, um, I had a snack before I jumped on and I've also got a um, bowl of cashews here in case we're making real <laughs> okay. philosophical progress and things get desperate. But I could do another 20 minutes. I could go to eight my time if you want. Okay. Yeah. Perfect. I, I don't want to, impinge on your dinner time. And uh, I have to teach my morning classes as well. So I have a, um, I haven't had breakfast either. But anyway, so I, I, there's a lot that we haven't got, I haven't got to ask you about, but um, uh, I want to make sure that we can kind of touch some bases on this. So, so one of the things that I was going to ask was, well, I know your view on it, but I want to kind of press you on it was that whether or not these psychedelic experiences um, are, are evidence for limitivism about the self. And you take a kind of mm. qualitate, a, a, qual, a qualified view of this in the book and say, well, even if not full on eliminativism, then at least like radical revision about our ordinary conception of the self. Um, yeah. but, I, but I suspect that you think there's more there that you could say about this, um, like towards the full on eliminativist case. So I wonder what your view about the self, like what evidence, evidential standards uh, status does the psychedelics have here, do you think? Yeah, I mean, I've actually become profoundly agnostic about this. I'm sorry to disappoint. I okay. <laughs> used to be a, used to be a staunch no self theorist until I read that great paper by Tom McClellan that I cite in the book uh, that just really made me rethink the whole thing because I had, like so many people, been relying on this straightforward mismatch argument for eliminativism about the self. We represent the self as a certain type of entity. No real entity matches the description, therefore the self is not real. And my jaw hit the floor when McClellan pointed out the straightforwardly obvious fact that that argument is invalid. I just right. it never, never occurred to me before, but it's so obvious once it's pointed out that you can radically misrepresent something that nonetheless exists. Um, and so then it becomes really tricky because then, you know, obviously in some cases in the history of science, we have a, a vast mismatch and the eliminative conclusion seems like the right one to draw, phlogiston, caloric, luminiferous ether. Um, right. And obviously in other cases, uh, there's a great mismatch and we don't go eliminative, we go revisionary. And so, um, you know, I wonder now whether, I'd be really interested in any thoughts you have about this, but I wonder whether there are any principled criteria um, that tell us when we should go revisionary and when we should go eliminative. But I also increasingly suspect that it's a pragmatic question at most, that it's kind of a, a, a verbal um, dispute. I mean, it's, you know, convenient to decide that a dispute is verbal once you start losing it. But um, if, <laughs> you know, if McClelland and I both agree that, uh, I don't know to what extent he does agree, but if we both agree that we represent the self as being an entity with all these properties, boundedness, persistence, free will, and so on, and that nothing in reality has um, the those properties. Well, I mean, you know, one of the things he does is he appeals to ideas about reference and ideas about Desai representation. And Jakob right. Hovey and John Michael did something similar. So at the same time, they kind of published a, a paper, a chapter on predictive processing in the self at the same time as Phil Gerens and I published our paper. And the accounts were very similar. I mean, they differed in detail and emphasis, but very similar hierarchical predictive processing story about the self. Philip and I said, there is no self. Um, Jakob and John said, um, the self model itself is the self. And um, one of the reasons was it kind of plays some of the roles that the self is supposed to play. Um, and another reason, at least as I read them, I, it seemed like they were appealing maybe to the causal theory of reference, that like this self model that causes our behavior and so on that is kind of the thing that causes us to use this term, I or me. So that's what the term is referring to. And so you need to, you know, it looks like if there is a principled way to do it, you need to get into issues in the theory of reference, um, issues about to say representation. But I don't even, I mean, you know, I don't want to be too controversial, but I don't even know if I believe in reference um, as some, <laughs> you, know, I, you know, as some real fact. I don't know if there is some kind of real fact in the world to be discovered about whether our self models really refer to the organism or the brain or themselves or fail to refer. Um, yeah. So, yeah, I mean, it, 
in 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 that chapter in the book it kind of seems a bit like i'm dodging the question and i think that's sort of what i thought i was doing at the time making a pragmatic decision to shelve it and, and say that's not the most important thing here but the more and more i think about it the more and more i think maybe the question just dissolves i see um, so, I mean, again, because I think, I mean, for someone like me, I'm sort of attracted to like causal theories of reference, um, causal historical, maybe teleosemantics, stuff like that. So if you have a view like that, then there is going to be a kind of fact of the matter about what, what we're picking out when we uh, think about the self. But if you have like a Quinean descriptivist view um, or something like that, then, or, then it's a lot less clear uh, when you're... Um, describing the thing when the thing satisfies the description or not, if there's no thing that satisfies the description then straightforwardly i guess it can be really indeterminate whereas if there's a causal relation that really matters here then you can radically misdescribe the thing and still count as thinking about it so i think the mccullen yeah. kind of uh, objection depends on a certain theory of reference mm -hmm. um and so if you're agnostic about the theories of reference in general then i think it, you, the argument doesn't really work or it's good you have to defend one so, but what do you think, though, as someone who I understand has been very sympathetic to eliminativism about the self and is also sympathetic to the type of theory of reference on which the McClelland argument depends? Yeah. If you don't mind my asking. No, I don't mind the, it at the, all. The um, so for, for me, um, I because I am sympathetic to eliminativism or you know, neural nihilism, as uh, Evan called it, uh, um, but it's with respect to a certain kind of thing. So I, I, for me, one of the things that is the definitional of the self is um, an entity that stays the same through time and counts for personal identity. Um, and that's not necessarily the notion of self that you're interested in um, or that we're talking about in this discussion about psychedelic therapy. It's not really, um, it does, you don't need to have an, a kind of metaphysically enduring or perduring or whatever you want, to, whatever your theory of you know, existing through time is, you don't need one of those things to, to get the benefits that we're talking about. You can do it with psychological continuity and those other sorts of things. Um, oh, yeah. So so mostly I'm a limitivist about the thing which exists through time. Um, and uh, the reason I'm a limitivist about that is because I, well, for metaphysical reasons, but also I think that when we think about the self, we're picking something out and the thing that causes our thoughts about it isn't the kind of thing that we attribute those properties to. So that's how mm. I see the two kind of going together is that you can, that there is something that we're thinking about. That thing can be called the self um, in a deflationary sense, um, but it's not, not the sense which there's nothing which stays the same over time. I mean, so that's why I can say, well, there is a deflationary notion of the self, but not in the way that we think about it. Um, the thing mm. that we think we're thinking about doesn't exist, but uh, we are picking mm. something out, a self model, so to speak. So yeah, I'm happy yeah. saying that the self model is just, that's what there is. That's, that's the, that's all that there is. And the other thing isn't there. And for you, the self model is the referent of I, and it is the referent of our I thoughts and things like yeah, that. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. And yeah, in fact, I think something even kind of stronger that in a lot of cases when we're thinking of thoughts that have like the mental analog of the word I, um, the self is implicit there and we're not really picking anything out unless someone forces us to. So, mm -hmm. <clears throat> if you think, you know, I think this, then um, normally no one comes up to you and says, wait, who's this I you're talking about? Who is it that you're thinking about? Um, but if someone did sort of do that, then we would say, you know, this thing, me. And so I think that the very, the, the minimal notion is just the, the biological organism. Um, and then there's, you know, you can get past that. But I really, if someone challenged you, like, who is it that's having these thoughts? I know this happens in cases of like thought insertion and so forth. But in the normal case, <clears throat> that doesn't ever come up. No one ever, mm -hmm. you know, wonders who is it that's really having these thoughts. Um, mm -hmm. And it's kind of just left implicit that there's a there's a self. So I would say that it's um, I, I like your idea that it's the center of um, narrative gravity. I thought that was kind of an interesting idea. So I think I'm pretty much find myself attracted to that kind of view as well. Well, representational gravity, because Dan, it's right, right. um, Dan, it's the so, sorry, that's what I meant. gravity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sorry, Freudian slip. Yeah, I was thinking about Dennett, but uh, <laughs> representational gravity. So I like Dennett the idea that it's the center of, yeah, exactly. <laughs> that it's the center of representational gravity. I think that's a really cool idea. And I think, yeah, cool. Of, that sits well with what I was thinking. But why did you think there was a kind of tension there or something? Is that why you were asking me that? Oh, yeah, I guess, because, um, 
yeah, I took you to be saying that you thought McClellan's case against eliminativism um, depended on the causal theory of reference and you, you were sympathetic to that. So I wondered if that, you know, maybe put pressure on your um, eliminativism. But yeah. Um, yeah. So I take it, yeah, part of your position is that you do have a, a, a conception of because this is another part of McClellan's argument. I'm sorry, I, I don't want to kind of totally derail and turn this into a conversation about the self if you've got other things you want to grill me on. But um, yeah, part of his his um, argument as well is to say, well, you could try and do it by establishing necessary conditions on being a self, but good luck doing that in a non-question begging way, uh, basically. Right. Yeah, no, and I agree with that. Um, but that's why I think that the notion that we're eliminating is a specific one defined in a specific way. And the other thing, uh, this is largely why I also agree with you what you're saying. That's largely a terminological point at that point. Um, so it depends on what you mean by the self. And, you know, when you talk to people like Evan and he's, he says, well, this, you know, this, uh, this, their self is real. Um, and well, what do you mean by that? Actually it just means like sort of what we mean by it, but he wants to call that thing the self. And so I think mm -hmm. that a lot of that, at that point, it just boils down to, well, what do you want to call the self? And that's a, a definitional terminological debate. Yeah. 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 So like, getting back to, to your view, because I did want to ask, so if you're not in limited it's about the self, which I guess I, I did sense you were dodging the question there, but now I see why. Um, but one thing that you don't, don't want to dodge the question on is whether there can be experiences that fully lack a self. Yes. Um, so whether the self is required to have experiences at all. And in the book, you're a little bit even dodgy on this question, but I know you have a paper on this where you like are not dodging, you don't dodge it at all. And you straightforwardly argue that, you know, certain kinds of psychedelic experiences, um, I think you think falsify the claim that, uh, that the self is involved in every phenomenally conscious experience i do but the reason i keep dodging questions in the book is because i keep publishing papers and then people keep raising great objections and i just <laughs> couldn't <laughs> couldn't figure out how to answer the objections before i had to finish the book um, <laughs> <so>. <laughs> okay well that's <laughs> that makes sense but what so what's can you tell us a little about the, about the argument there and what the great objection is yeah, yeah. So, I mean, it's very straightforward. So there is this claim that, um, you know, it's impossible to have um, phenomenally conscious mental states without any sense of self. And um, it's got a long history in philosophy, um, according to those who have done their homework better than I have. It goes back to Aristotle. It's certainly in Locke and Husserl and some of these people in certain guises. Um, and so there's now this debate about, well, are there empirical counterexamples to this? And a lot of the debates have focused on various pathological conditions, thought insertion, depersonalization, and um, the analysis of those uh, cases is always very controversial, but my argument is simple and I kind of take off from this chapter by um, Bion and Krieger, Alexandra Bion and Uriah Krieger, in which they look at various cases and what they seem to say, they don't quite say it outright. So they're, they're proponents of this subjectivity principle, the idea that it's impossible to have phenomenally conscious mental states without any sense of self. And what they seem to say about some of these mental states in depersonalization is, look, the evidence for these lacking all forms of the sense of self is really strong um, and there's no way of explaining it away. So the only thing we can say is that actually these mental states are not phenomenally conscious. As I say, they don't put it that bluntly, but they right. have various other things they think you can say about states like thought insertion. And they seem to think that none of these are really very promising for these depersonalization states. You can't kind of, you know, the people are very emphatic that it's not some extra new sense of alienation being added to their experience. It's something missing it's being taken away they're very emphatic that they have lost all forms of self-awareness and so the only way you can then um, preserve the principle and not have this be a counter example is to say well those mental states are not phenomenally conscious and so my argument is if you look at certain reports of psychedelic experiences they are at least equal to those depersonalization states in terms of the evidence for lacking all sense of self the evidence is every bit as strong, if not more so. And yet there's no grounds whatsoever for a denial of these states are phenomenally conscious. And right. I'm pretty skeptical about that denial, even in the depersonalization case, but there are some sort of things they can point to there where people talk about, you know, I feel unconscious or I feel like a zombie or whatever. And I think when you look at these cases, like Michael Pollan's experience on 5-MeO-DMT, I've got another experience by a research subject who has injected DMT and N-dimethyltryptamine. And they seem to be very emphatic that they are having vivid, memorable, conscious experiences in which there was absolutely no sense of self whatsoever. So the argument, yeah, that's the argument. It's really simple. Yeah. Right. 
it, it gets a little complicated though once you sort of start distinguishing. I know you do in your paper. So there's the you know the mindness, the sense of ownership. There's meanness, which is maybe the narrative self, and then there's the for meanness bit. Um, and so I, I, you know, as someone who defends higher order theories, I'm not a convinced person, you know, I'm, I'm pretty open, but I have spent a lot of my time defending, you know, the plausibility of higher order approaches to consciousness. Um, mm. And I know that they are camped and put in this group. I know Uriah is a, you know, self-representational guy, but he's in, it's largely the same, similar um, to higher order theories. Uh, so the idea that this puts pressure on those kinds of theories, I guess, is what I would kind of want to resist. Um, I think there's some of them that they do, like Rocco Gennaro, he, he explicitly invokes like parietal cortices and areas that are involved in self-representation of the self as to be important for the higher areas. Um, but I don't know if they really put pressure on like what Dan Sahavi calls the kind of inner awareness views, right? That there's a kind of awareness of, because even in thought insertion, there's this, they, they say that these thoughts are inserted into their mind. Like one guy says, it's like a screen that the thing is shown on. So there's even, there's a sense in which the, the thoughts are for them um, even if they're not experienced as being their thought, they're in their mind. Uh, oh yeah, totally. Yeah. So, uh, but you have some interesting these things to say about this this for meanness and these distinctions. So, uh, what, what's the argument against this kind of? Um, you have a dilemma here, I guess, which is what I'm pressing you to talk about. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. Absolutely. So, my my dilemma is this, right? Is this for meanness of which you speak um, a genuinely phenomenological feature or not? Um, and if it is, there should be some conceivable report, however weird sounding, that somebody would give that should lead us to conclude that it was absent. Um, and to my mind, if there is any such thing, it's these reports that the psychedelic subjects give. They're so emphatic. And we can go into the details of why, but they talk about the very kind of subject-object structure of experience being altered. And I think Michael Pollan's report in particular is really um, interesting in this regard. But, yeah, it's on the one hand... Um, it's an experiential feature on which case you should regard these reports as describing its absence. Otherwise, what possible report would you regard as describing its absence? And then on the other hand, it's not a genuinely experiential feature. It's just some kind of relation of epistemic access between the self and its mental states, right? I can access this state in a way that you can't. Well, that to me is not in itself a phenomenal feature. Um, right. The claim seems to be that that epistemic relation is invariably accompanied by a phenomenal feature, but I'm trying to give counterexamples to precisely that generalization. So the move I think that um, people like Zahavi make a lot in this sort of context is to equivocate between the deflationary and the non-deflationary interpretation of four minutes and say, look, because this epistemic ace symmetry is there because I can access this experience in a way that you can't therefore this phenomenal feature is there and um, yeah my, my claim is that that's question begging in the context where precisely what's at issue is whether the phenomenal feature invariably accompanies the epistemic relation and so yeah the dilemma is either it's a really gen either you're talking about a real phenomenal feature in which case what could be a clearer description of its absence than this or you're not talking about a phenomenal feature in which case you're not talking about what i'm talking about so it doesn't matter yeah so i think that's interesting i mean one thing here is the difference between like the absence of the self and the expansion of the self which i know you talk about so there's a question about whether you want to describe these experiences as the self dissipating or whether it it's expanding to encompass everything uh, all together. Um, and I think that's compatible with what these people are saying, uh, because of it, when you have these kinds of experiences, really the ineffability part kicks in. Uh, they're really difficult to put into words. And so people kind of grope for a way to express the experience verbally. And to, so they may use this kind of language and it may not be I mean, I don't want to discount the experiences and say they're, you know, they're not phenomenal content. I think that's bizarre, but they may be misdescribing them in certain ways because of how bizarre the experiences are. Yeah, uh, yeah. But do you think that this, the difference between expansion and dissolution matters? I know you have a footnote about this, but I wasn't clear about whether you really thought that this was uh, a way of answering the objection or not. Yeah, no. So that's, that's kind of the awesome objection that I don't really know how to answer. Okay, um, good. And... <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I mean, I should say, so I, you know, I, on balance, I still think my thesis in that paper is correct. I still think these are genuine counterexamples, but I've kind of, you know, so that paper was published in a special issue of this new journal, Philosophy and the Mind Sciences, edited by yeah. um, Jenny Vint and Sasha Fink and Co. And um, uh, 
there was another paper in that same special issue by uh, I think it's Miguel Sebastian, really putting pressure on the idea that psychedelic states uh, demonstrate the possibility of totally selfless consciousness. And um, he was the one who kind of made this objection about ego dissolution versus ego expansion. Um, okay. And he made a couple of other really good arguments as well. Um, and yeah, that's a great of, philosopher, by the way. Yeah. Agree. Yeah. Um, I was not familiar with his work prior to this, but um, yeah, I actually refereed that paper and thought it was fantastic. Um, yeah. So yeah, it's really like the McClellan paper. It's kind of um, got me questioning myself a bit, at least it's, it's, you know, it's not changed my view, but it's made me less overwhelmingly confident in it. Um, <laughs> but I think, you know, as I say, I think the killer point about Michael Pollan's report in particular um, is, well, okay. So first of all, the DMT subject, who I quote in the book, who had this experience of white light, pure being, pure ecstasy, no space, no time, no self. Well, yeah, I mean, it is hard to conclude definitively, um, you know, to discriminate definitively between ego dissolution versus ego expansion. But principle of charity, if you want to kind of interpret it at all, let's just take it at face value. And what he says is not, I became everything, but no self. He specifically says no self, nothing except the white light. Um I mean, you know, this is probably going to depend on how high a prior one has for the possibility of selfless consciousness, right? So right. if one thinks there's really, really overwhelming antecedent evidence against it, then one is going to interpret these reports in accordance with that. I can see that. But, um, yeah, the Michael Pollan report in particular seems to me really telling because he says whatever this was, it was not a hallucination, something that a lot of people say of their psychedelic experiences. A hallucination requires a reality, a point of reference, and an entity to have it. None of those things remained. And so I interpret that through the lens of some ideas of Thomas Metzinger's about the self right. model and what he calls the phenomenal model of the intentionality relation, the sense that we always have this um, feeling of standing in kind of epistemic and representational relations, fallible epistemic and re representational relations to a world external to ourselves. And it's that that creates the sense that there is a possibility of error. And so to my mind, the best way to explain what Pollen is saying there, this couldn't possibly be a hallucination because there was no entity, no point of reference, is that, that structure, precisely what I take Zahavi and Co to be getting at when they talk about for me, is that structure of there being someone to whom the experience is given. Um, I take that structure to be part of experience, right? And, and I don't think it's part of every experience, but I think it's part of 99.999% of experiences. And that's why we have this kind of um, totally bedrock feeling that there is someone to whom the experience is given. To me, Pollen sounds a hell of a lot like he's describing an experience in which that almost invariable feature was gone. And that's why he just can't kind of um, wrap his head around the idea that there was someone hallucinating because there was no one who could hallucinate. There was no one having an experience. Right. Um, there was just yeah. this total void. I mean, I, I think a lot turns on whether this thing we're talking about is part of the phenomenology or not. I know people like Uriah, they, they do think it's there. And I guess I tend to think it's there as well. But I, so one, one response that I was thinking about when I was reading this was um, the pollen case. I mean, it does sound like a hallucination or it could sound like a hallucination of the lack of a self. Um, so w one way of interpreting these kinds of weird experiences is that you're, I mean, we're not going to be able to, sadly, oh, by the way, we're going to have to have you back uh, someday because I still want to talk about all the ep epistemic stuff, the naturalized spirituality stuff. There's so much interesting stuff in your work. Um, if, you, if, you, if you have the opportunity to come back, I would like to invite you. But um, because yeah. I'm noticing now I'm pushing the limits on your dinner and my morning classes. Um, well, but, it's, it's up to you. I mean, so yeah, it's, I'm in no tearing hurry. So it's really up to you. Okay. All right. So, um, but so what my, what my thought was, how do we tell, so obviously they, these people are on drugs. Um, so the, there's, a, you say we should interpret them at face value. And I guess I tend to agree. Um, there's no pressing reason to, to deny what they're experiencing, but I guess there might be a pressing reason to deny that they're experiencing something that's veridical. So I wonder when someone, I mean, because all of the asymp, 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 uh, why can't I say that word? Symmetric, asymmetric, there you go. Um, all the asymmetricity <laughs> that Zahavi talks about are still there. Um, but you take that to be the non-experiential aspect, right? So that's, yeah, that's yeah. interesting. But that stuff but is I still there because I can't access Pollen's experience. And there's still a sense in which he experienced it 
not maybe as part of for himself, but as something that he could talk to you about in a way that you couldn't talk to him about. Um, totally. So those things are there. Uh, and I take this a hobby point to kind of be, well, given those things are there, we expect the other thing is there. And why couldn't we then say, yeah, maybe it was, but he misidentified it or was under the impression that it was absent when it really wasn't. So I wonder how you might respond to that sort of kind of claim. Yeah, yeah. And I mean, I have no issue with the claim about epistemic asymmetry. And to just to be really clear, I absolutely believe that that experience, that phenomenal state occurred entirely within the biological brain of the, the organism that we point at and say Michael Pollan. I have right. no doubt whatsoever about that. Um, and yeah, I mean, you could certainly say that because the epistemic asymmetry was there, the phenomenal feature must have been too. I guess my point is just what are the grounds for saying that? Um, I mean, yeah, especially when the question at issue is whether the one invariably accompanies the other. And I think, you know, I think it is true that, like, in my paper, I probably overstate how unambiguous and unequivocal these reports are. Like, I think they're pretty strikingly clear, but the thing that Miguel right. points out in his paper is that, you know, what you really want is subjects who are, you know, philosophers who know about um, for meanness and meanness and mindness and who, you know, can demonstrate that they're au fait with all these distinctions and come back and say, no, it was that one that was absent. Right. Well, yeah, all of them were absent. Not even that one was there. And so he has some interesting comments at the end of the paper about, um, you know, how we could actually try and test this empirically in future. And so, I guess, you know, I I don't think there's, you know, so I start my paper by saying there's an impasse, you know, with the depersonalization cases, a rational person could go either way. I guess maybe I think that too, even in light of my psychedelic cases, I can see how a really um, committed kind of for meanness person could still hold on to that in light of these cases. But I think what would be important is to kind of say what would count as evidence against this generalization that that phenomenal feature invariably accompanies that epistemic relation so what what would count as a um a successful counter example right yeah no i think that's a good challenge for this uh kind of thing here um so i i wonder though how you so like for someone like me uh so i think like what i was saying is that you have certain higher order theorists who this counts as good evidence against. I think people like Rocco Gennaro come to mind. Um, they specifically say the kind of higher order awareness is a, an awareness that involves the self. Um, but then you have theorists like David Rosenthal, who's obviously a higher order theorist and higher thought theorist kind of originates with him. Um, but he doesn't think that it's part of the phenomenology as far as yeah, I understand yeah. it. It's just that there is this kind of higher order awareness that renders the states conscious um, but you don't ever experience that, uh, except in the rare cases of introspection, which, you know, the kind of bracketing of the Husserlian notion, which are relatively rare. But you, I don't think you have an argument against that kind of view here, do you? No, and I don't really take a... Yeah, only only views that really do entail this phenomenological claim that all, all phenomenal consciousness comes along with some form of self-consciousness. That's the only target. And I kind of, I, I remain, you know, I, I do my usual move and dodge the question. I remain fairly neutral in the paper on which of these theories of consciousness are actually committed to that. I just say, well, any of them that are, this is going to be bad news for them. Um, but yeah, any that are not, um, varieties of um, higher order theories that don't, um, that aren't committed to that phenomenological claim, fine. Yeah, there's nothing for them to worry about here I don't think right okay so yeah because I so I wasn't sure if you thought that maybe this these uh psychedelic cases counted as a general argument against there being any sort of inner awareness as opposed to just a no it's a, a counter example to the phenomenological claim that uh some some kind of forminess is present in phenomenology of every experience besides now it's clear that you're saying the latter not the former I am saying the latter I mean I guess I think it's sort of it raises a, a challenge maybe for such views. I don't know if I'd even say as put it as strongly as a challenge, but it raises the possibility that those views are somehow ultimately derived from a mistaken intuition, right? Because I talk about this access assumption, the idea that consciousness yeah. consists in the accessing of mental states by a subject. And I owe that terminology to my supervisors, Jared O'Brien and John Opie, and I sort of agree with them. They say that, you know, this is the, you know, the worst bad idea, most tenacious bad idea <laughs> bedeviling uh, the study of consciousness they're sort of paraphrasing a line from Dennett I don't, don't think I'd go that far but I do think 
You know, I think it's an intuition that is based on this kind of ubiquitous structure of phenomenal experience. But I mean, you know, I don't want to kind of commit a, a genetic fallacy. Like, obviously, like the um, questions about these theories need to be decided on the arguments and evidence. But to the extent that the appeal of theories like that derives from this intuition about an access assumption, I think the kind of debunking story about the access assumption undermines them. Um, yeah. I, mean, I guess like for the Rosenthal's of the world, the appeal of the theory stems from um, what he claims is like a folk psychological platitude that if you're in a mental state, but not in any way aware of yourself as being in the mental state, then it's just not there. It's not conscious. Well, right. Um, and so that, these that's, arguments, that's not yeah. the, that's the opposite kind of phenomenological claim. So it's not that in every conscious case, I can tell there's the for is there. It's rather that when it's lacking, we don't call the state conscious. Um, right. So it's the, coming right. from the opposite direction. But it is still that same intuition operative that consciousness is what happens when a subject stands in some relation of awareness or access to their mental states. So, yeah, yeah. I, I guess I would want to say that, you know, I think this kind of psychedelic slash altered state debunking argument puts pressure on those kinds of arguments, the arguments for those theories that appeal to those sorts of intuitive or uh, folk psychological considerations. Yeah. yeah, I think that's interesting. Um, okay, so we're really getting on in time here, and uh, I, I do have to r wrap this up. Um, but I, I know that, so let's bring this all the way full circle back to your account of the how we're going to get around the comforting um, the delusion objection. So uh, regardless of how you feel about, because you even say this in the book, you're like, look, whether they're totally selfless experience. Uh, is not really relevant because I think that there's very strong claim that you can, you could, excuse me, you can make here that our ordinary conception of the self is radically revised or changed under these kinds of experiences. And that's what's doing the therapeutic work here. So these yes. other questions are interesting. They're raised by these sorts of experiences, but they don't question the main thesis of your book, right? That's right. Absolutely. Yeah. That's almost just, you know, if the book is about philosophy and psychedelics and I'm talking about the self, well, I probably need to say something about this, but yeah, it's kind of secondary to the main point. Absolutely. Which is that, you know, yeah, psychedelic therapy is not about coming to believe in cosmic consciousness. It's about changing your sense of self, irrespective of whether there is any metaphysically real self or not. It's about changing your self sense of who you are um, and kind of bringing you to not only change it, but also to appreciate its kind of contingency and its constructedness nature um and that you know from a naturalistic standpoint that is a process that has considerable epistemic benefits or at least presents epistemic opportunities and one of the interesting things you say about the pollen case too is or I, maybe it wasn't pollen i forget who it was that you were quoting when you say this but you said they you thought they had a kind of actual experience of the ego dissolving uh, or no that, that's not the way you put it that they had a veridical experience of what the that the self is constructed um mm. and that they that you're that part of the therapy Part of the therapeutic benefits, uh, benefits here involve recognizing that these things aren't um, objective in a sense, but they are the product of our own assumptions, experiences, etc., which then makes you able to change them because you realize they're not out there, so to speak. Right. And that's one of the points where kind of therapeutic mechanisms and epistemic benefits meet. It's kind of this phenomenal opacity, moving the self model along the continuum from transparency to opacity. In other words, going from experiencing it as just reality in itself to experiencing it as a constructed mental model. And um, my thought is that that's how, you know, you've got this sort of general effect of psychedelics of creating kind of cognitive plasticity, psychological plasticity. And that's how that manifests at the phenomenological level is this kind of realization that my sense of self is constructed as a model is something that I can change. And then in the kind of um, epistemological idiom, I talk about that as knowledge by acquaintance with the, right. the modal fact that the sense of self is um, constructed and contingent. Yeah. Right. So one, one, one does wonder kind of though here, <clears throat> why you don't get the opposite kind of cases. Um, <clears throat> I mean, why, why some of these things are strengthened. Uh, mm. Maybe, maybe this is what happens in the bad cases and you're not really examining those cases, but I do wonder what your thoughts about that are. Yeah. So there's kind of, um, it's anecdotally fairly well attested that psychedelic experiences, you know, 
as well as sort of being uh, ego dissolving and sometimes leading to humility and so on, can exacerbate narcissism and grandiosity and this kind of thing. So this is maybe the kind of thing um, right. you're getting at. Um, yeah. It doesn't seem to happen in the recent research, as far as I can tell, and that's probably um, unless there are cases that are sort of being under-described or not mentioned, but um, certainly if it is happening, it doesn't seem to be happening very much, and that's presumably got a lot to do with the uh, therapeutic setting and the way the whole process operates. Um, yeah, I mean, there was one uh, paper just published recently, a big survey study of people having their own psychedelic experiences out in the world in uncontrolled conditions. And it did find that there was um, evidence of decreased narcissistic tendencies and interestingly um, correlating not with ego dissolution, but with awe. So awe during the experience is what, what predicted decreased ah, narcissism. But, um, yeah, but yeah, certainly um, anecdotally, things like that do happen. Um, and I mean, you know, I guess some of these cases as well where people are saying um, I rediscovered my previous values or I kind of um, becoming who I was earlier or getting back in touch with my earlier self. In some sense, that's kind of strengthening what's already there. Um, right. I guess, yeah, I guess you could just view it as, you know, the whole thing comes unbound and then there are many possibilities for how it could be put back together. And especially if how it has been put together lately has not been great, then some of the other or older possibilities are going to be more attractive, are going to capture attention. Um, yeah, I, I guess I was also thinking like you don't really find cases of like the smoker who <clears throat> has their identity as a smoker, like firmly entrenched as a result of the experience. Yeah. They're, they're like, I see now there's no escape, uh, you know, because you hear sometimes people ex saying things like that, you know, like I felt like I was going crazy and there was no way of getting out of this experience. And um, but you don't but it doesn't. So I wonder if there's this the, a possibility of therapeutic backfire where the habits are more firmly entrenched or their identity as an addict is more firmly like they really come to see themselves as worthless or uh, that these things can't escape. But it, but we haven't seen anything like that. So I was just curious mm. about, about why that might be. Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I would say, yeah, a priori, there's no reason to think that sort of thing can't happen. It almost certainly does sometimes. Um, I would say kind of, yeah, the set and setting that seems to facilitate, if not a full-blown classic mystical experience, at least this mystical type experience of positively valenced kind of disintegration of the sense of self with prior therapeutic intent is probably very important in accounting for that, right? I mean, yeah. everyone who's yeah, everyone who's going into the trials for tobacco addiction is going in with the intent of quitting and they have, you know, some kind of therapeutic protocol. I can't remember what it was for the tobacco one. I know in a study of alcoholism, they use motivational enhancement therapy, but, you know, before okay. they even have the psilocybin, there's a lot of preparation. There's kind of intent that this is what's going to happen. And then kind of creating the circumstances under which the sense of self can be, you know, kind of diminished, disintegrated. You can have this expansive sort of open feeling with the positive valence going along with it and a feeling of safety and security. Um, right. I mean, it's a bit hand wavy. You would want more mechanistic detail, but I think that's got to account for a lot of why you see, see the one and not the other. Right. Okay. Uh, and I also just wonder kind of finally about, um, whether or not this is cheating in a sense, because you can get some of the same um, effects in meditative practices. You know, people describe, you, you talk about the similarities between, um, you know, certain meditative practices and the kind of experiences that you have under psychedelics. And so one wonders if you should do the hard work and, you know, focus on changing the self through these non uh, hallucinatory experiences um, and you, you suggest no, that, you know, that this is a, a perfectly good way of doing it. So I wonder if we could just say a little bit about that before we're finished. Yeah, yeah. So, um, I mean, the, the label that's being given, I can't remember, I think it was Jared Clerman, but the name someone gave to that kind of view is pharmacological Calvinism, right? Yeah. The idea that there is this... Um, <laughs> It's very apt. There is this kind of virtue in, in you know, hard work and that one ought only to, to use drugs as an absolute last resort, to which I right. say, why? Why yeah. on earth? I mean, we just have this, yeah, totally weird um, way of thinking about drugs in our culture. And, you know, the fact that psychoactive substances have been used kind of responsibly, medicinally, sacramentally as integral parts of many, many cultures um, since time immemorial doesn't show that it's good, obviously. Um, I don't want to make that kind of appeal to tradition, but it kind of right. serves to, as a kind of instructive contrast to our sort of deep-seated reflexive pharmacological Calvinism or just, you know, 
our, our kind of mistrust. And, uh, you know, I mean, there's some good reason for it. Obviously, drugs, like other things, have dangers and it's possible to use them poorly and irresponsibly and harmfully. Um, and uh, from a completely practical standpoint, right, it depends what you're looking for. And so if you look at the the compare and contrast between psychedelics and meditation specifically, taking psychedelics is not going to get, get you everything that meditating can get you. Um, right. So there's just a straightforward practical sense in which if you have certain objectives in terms of um, changing your personality, your patterns of attention, spiritual growth, and so on. Um, there are just certain things that meditation can get you that psychedelics can't and vice versa too. Um, so especially if, you know, in kind of um, psychiatric cases where you're really in the grip of sort of, um, uh, you know, profound suffering, depression, anxiety, whatever, especially if you've got a terminal diagnosis and you don't have much time. I mean, notoriously meditation practice takes a long time to bear fruit. Um, right. So, yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I know it's I find this a really a lot in my students <clears throat> when we're talking about this, they they have this really strong reaction like there's there's something yeah, I like the pharmacological Calvinism line because yeah, that's a kind of it's a real sort of this is a shortcut and you're sort of a bad person for taking it instead of doing the hard work. And I, I think that yeah, hopefully that is a, a product of our culture. Um, and we should reshape the way we think about drugs. I think that's an important message, which is coming out of the kind of work that you're doing. Um, do, mm. Is there a worry here, uh, sort of on the same note about cultural appropriation, though? Uh, some of these like sacred things that we're taking and using for these other purposes, but divorced of all the spiritual and you know cultural aspects, like especially with ayahuasca and stuff like that. I wonder. Yeah, is this I mean, a worry? There's I mean, I think there's definitely a worry about that with ayahuasca, given what's going on with the whole kind of ayahuasca tourism scene. A lot of that yeah. is getting very messy. I mean, I must confess, I haven't looked into these issues or thought about them in much detail. Um, I find it interesting on this front that LSD was sort of discovered um, in a kind of Western scientific um, pharmacological setting and was used sort of quite independently. It's sort of like that almost came on the scene first in terms of mainstream science in the 1940s. And then it was later in the 50s after Gordon Wasson went to Mexico and had psilocybin mushrooms in a traditional ceremony that people realised we're dealing with a, a unified class of drugs. So right. I think there might be some worries about that, but I think, you know, it's also clear that a lot of suffering is being alleviated and a lot of that is happening because we've learned some important lessons about how to use these sorts of substances responsibly, both from cultures that have been using them for a long time and from kind of trial and error in the 50s and 60s. And so, yeah, yeah specific issues about ayahuasca aside, I don't see that there's a fundamental problem with um, the way these drugs are being used in kind of therapeutic contexts at the moment. And, um, you know, I mean, it is, it's, it's it, you know, there's a ritual structure to it, which a lot of people have pointed out. It's not, I mean, when you're getting kind of experienced trippers in um, fMRIs and um, injecting them with LSD and psilocybin and scanning their brain, it's all very kind of clinical and scientific, but in the studies that are looking at um, therapeutic and transformative effects, it's obviously very different, but there's a certain very abstract uh, ritual dimension to it, which clearly right. has been, yeah, partly a product of trial and error and partly a product of um, inspiration from um, traditional modes of use. But yeah. And that's part of that. your, your line too about the knowledge how, right? That part of what they're doing here is like learning how to, to take this trip or how to use the drugs uh, in a it's an important in a sense i mean that's more what benny shannon says and he's talking specifically about ayahuasca but i sort of take that idea and um, i probably haven't been clear enough on this because he says yeah through taking ayahuasca repeatedly people become skilled in the art of drinking ayahuasca they learn how to do this gracefully and responsibly and i've sort of said well what does that actually amount to and then it probably sounds like i'm saying it amounts to this one thing and only this which isn't what i mean to say there's more to mm. it than that that involves the traditional ceremonial context but my claim is that an important part of that skill the skill of kind of drinking ayahuasca well or taking psychedelics well is um, basically these mindfulness skills of kind of yeah attending openly curiously and non-reactively to one's own mental contents and okay that's so but that's less what of I the think. idea of the ritual or the the kind of preparatory stuff yeah, yeah. So I think kind of the profession of psychiatry has learned how to administer psychedelics reliably um, and responsibly from trial and error and from other cultures that use psychedelics. But 
yeah, when I'm talking in the book about knowledge, how I'm talking about individuals having the experience and then getting a taste of what it's like to relate to one's mental contents in that way and then coming out, um, you know, and people are talking about things like, I know how to relate to my emotions now, I know how to deal with my feelings, I know how to let them run through even if they're difficult and painful. So that's more what I'm what I'm getting at there. Yeah. I see. Okay. Yeah. And then so the, the whole naturalizing spiritual af- spirituality thing at the end of the book, um, I guess that's a, a topic for another day, but just really, really quickly, the idea there is that a lot of these things are spiritual, but not necessarily religious and metaphysical, and that's a good thing and we should cultivate it. Yeah, so it's just kind of plugging into this um, interest that philosophers have had in recent years in the question of whether spirituality is compatible with naturalism, because there is this idiom of spiritual, but not religious, right? So a lot of people say right. I'm spiritual, but not religious. And what it seems to connote is something like a direct, practical, experiential approach to issues of personal transformation and finding meaning in life and that kind of thing. Um, and so that raises the question, right? If it's this kind of practical, experiential, non-dogmatic thing, there's kind of this intuitive assumption that spirituality is kind of hitched to traditional religious metaphysics, that to be spiritual, you have to believe in spirits or, or yeah. uh, something like that, right? <laughs> um, but yeah, this th- it seems to get used in this way that refers to this phenomenon that is all about transformative practices and experiences that have traditionally been packaged with kind of religious metaphysics, but need, it's not obvious that they necessarily need be. And so the whole naturalizing spirituality project, and you've got people like Robert Solomon, Owen Flanagan, Ursula Goodenough, all kind of looking at uh, the other name for the what seems to be basically the same movement as religious naturalism. Right. Uh, but yeah, basically the question of can we pursue the dimensions of life and the sorts of practices and the sorts of experiences that are traditionally the province of religious or spiritual people is pursuing those sorts of practices and experiences compatible with the naturalistic outlook. And um, yeah, to my mind, psychedelic science provides a good opportunity to look at that question from an empirical standpoint, because people seem to like calling these experiences spiritual, whether or not they've had any prior interest in spirituality so to me it suggests these are paradigmatically spiritual experiences they kind of that seems to be the best word for them to a wide variety of people with a wide variety of prior worldviews so the thought is by looking closely at what's going on in these experiences we might get some evidence about whether paradigmatically spiritual experiences and transformative practices really are compatible with naturalism and of course that's yeah. where it plugs into the rest of the book where i'm saying look a lot of the time you have these mystical type experiences and you're getting connectedness you're getting aspiration you're getting these reflection on these big questions and philosophical mysteries but it's not always going hand in hand with these non-naturalistic metaphysical ideations about a divinity or cosmic consciousness or whatever and so the implication would be that sort of even persons without disorders uh, might eventually find use for psychedelics if they want to be spiritual but not religious or something right absolutely yeah and obviously these studies have been done so the studies um you know notably at uh, roland griffith's lab at johns hopkins lots of studies there with um healthy volunteers you know in some cases they've specifically recruited people who have some kind of spiritual or religious practice there was another study in which kind of I think those people also had a prior interest but there was kind of a variety of different conditions different schedules of psilocybin doses and also different degrees of support to engage in spiritual practices like meditation to see how they would interact um, and then recently there was this really interesting study in switzerland from franz vollenweider's group where um, they gave psilocybin or placebo to experienced meditators on the fourth day of a right. five-day silent group zen retreat Great. Um, coolest single study ever conducted with psychedelics, in my opinion. Um, and, you know, I don't know, uh, obviously, the metaphysical beliefs of all those participants, but it's certainly possible. I mean, Zen of all the, the forms of Buddhism is notoriously kind of anti-dogmatic and anti-doctrinaire. And it's certainly possible to be a dedicated Zen practitioner without believing in much of anything. So um, that seems relevant too. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Very cool. All right. So I, 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 I could keep going on and on forever, but we got to let you go. Uh, it's past dinner time. So let me just say, thank you very much for joining me. This has been a wonderful conversation. I've learned a lot from reading your stuff and thinking through these issues. And I, I really hope the book gets wide success. It deserves it. Thanks very much. Yeah. My pleasure. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, no problem. So just hang on for one second. I'll say bye off air, but uh, let's go ahead and finish this up. All right. So, uh, uh Oh, hold on. Um,
Yeah, okay. So we are off the air. 